Fill the ions and uh, mechanically filter the fluids and waste and electrolytes and acids and bases. And you're going to learn acid base balance and fluid electrolytes with Ms. Ward. I guess that she, she usually teaches that in the um, beginning of nursing uh, 112. But it is definitely, uh, the kidneys do definitely regulate the acid base and the fluid and electrolyte <coughs> balance. And um, the, the functional unit of our, our kidney you, or is a nephron, um, and there's over a million of them, and they filter about 1,200 mLs of blood per minute. And I had, I had read somewhere else that it was like 25%. Um, it could be up to 25% of the cardiac output. Um, uh, per minute, so that's that's a whole lot of blood going through there. So, so if you injure your kidney, that's that's a real dangerous situation. That's it was very risky. And then we got our ureters that are connected to the, the kidneys and take the the filtrate that's that's been um, completely processed and everything to uh, down to the bladder. And um, the, the kidneys though are are not in the um, peritoneal cavity. They're they're behind it. So so they they are more toward your back, your flank. Um, area and it, they call it. You you probably see co costo vertebral angle, and the costo has to do with your with your ribs, and and so in in this <coughs> in vertebral, so the, in this area, that's where your your, your kidneys are going to be, um, in the the posterior area, um, sort of under your ribs, um, between your ribs and your spine, or between the um, your axillary line and the spine. Okay, and then our, our bladder, um, of course, is where that, any, bladder is a word that, that really um, means that it's a container or a, a receptacle to store something. And in fact, that some cultures used um, animal bladders to, to carry water like across the desert and stuff like that. So, so um, you know, the, but, but you can have a bladder, we have a bladder in our blood pressure cuffs. That's what that, you know, it's a receptacle for the air when we, when we pump it up. And sometimes the bladder wears out and you have to replace it. Um, uh, so that, that's, that bladder is not just a physiological thing. Okay, I guess while I've got this here, I might as well get back in here. <coughs> the, on page three, that's a really, really good picture of the, the uh, urinary bladder. And it shows you where the, the ureters are joining from the back and then in the urethra. You can really see how it comes to a triangle. And, um, and the... The bladder wall has, does have four layers of it, like there's a mucous membrane layer and then connective tissue layer and then a, a smooth muscle layer that it goes three ways. There, it, it goes lengthwise, oblique, and circular mu muscle. So there's lots and lots of muscles in, in our bladder. So I guess it would have to, to be able to squeeze that urine out to, to um, be able to respond to what our brain is, is telling it. Um, and then one of the things that I think is kind of cool about the, the bladder is that you know, your bladder's are really tiny when it's empty and, and it has a lot of folds in it. It just sort of sort of wrinkles up and then it's sort of like a, when you blow up a balloon and then, then you deflate it and you see all the wrinkles in it and everything. And, and so the next time you blow it up, it's a whole lot easier, of course, because it's got, got those wrinkles in it. So it's, it's very expansive. Not expensive, but expansive. And um, the, the capacity is about 300 to 600 mLs. You may see in different um, sources that um, different numbers. You know, but just as long as you're in the ballpark, we're we're fine because uh, we know the different sources might tell you different things. But it, but stick with this one for for your, if you're studying for the, the test. If you see something else, then just go by this one. Okay, and um, anyway, then the, the pelvic floor um, is muscles that support the pelvic organs. So that's outside of those muscles that, that support the bladder. And then, so we have our sphincter muscles and um, pregnancy and childbirth and, and um, um, being, being overweight or obese can, can um, stretch your, um, those, those muscles and all that too. And our internal sphincter is involuntary and our external sphincter is, is voluntary. So we can... We can decide when we want to go to the bathroom unless we have a real big problem or we've just gone too long without going to the bathroom. I always tell the, the story where when I was six years old, um, there, one of our neighbors had just gotten a trampoline and all the kids in the neighborhood, it was the, um, all the families were gathered like in the summertime when we were all gathered after supper and the parents were talking in one yard and the kids were on the trampoline taking turns and 
time in it for five minutes or whatever, and, and I, it was almost my turn, and I had to go to the bathroom so bad, but it was like, oh, doggone if I'm going to miss my turn. <laughs> and as soon as it was my turn, I, I had held it for so long, and, and I was so excited, and, and I just felt my shoes filling up with something warm. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, <laughs> and so I had to, I had to, I was so embarrassed, that's why I remember that, because one of my, uh, my first grade teacher was, was the, the aunt of one of my friends that I was, uh, on the trampoline with or whatever. So I had to go go back to my house and change my, my clothes and everything. And of course, I was so mad at myself because I missed my turn. More so about missing the turn than the <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Okay. I'm sorry, y'all. I hate it when it does this, but it, it's been doing wacko stuff lately. I don't know. Jeff needs to come in and clean this thing up or something. Hope he can do it figure out what the problem is. Well, at least right now I don't have anything else open. Maybe that, maybe it's just getting aggravated, aggravated at all the stuff. But I'm to figure that out. Get this. I'm not going to go too so far, but then I wanted to show you some, some videos in just a minute. I'm not going to go too much further than this until when we do the videos. Because I think it's, they're on YouTube, but they're, they're teaching videos about um, what, what the functions are. I mean, we're kind of doing the, the anatomy part. But um, if, when you look on, on page four, you, you've got all that, um, that that really good picture there, and that's in your book. That's one that the Pearson uses a whole lot too. But um, anyway, the uh, if if you you can kind of kind of look at all of the things that, that these do, because I'm not going to repeat that because they're going to tell you that on the videos about what all those those parts do, because they're two different videos there. Um, and but but it does give. Um, I, what I, I do one of the things that I do test you on is what happens, you know, with the production of urine and in what order. So just know that you're going to get a question on that. You know, that's just something that, and I know you probably had it in anatomy and physiology, but I think it's real important, right, um, you know, when you're starting to get medications in, in uh, clinical that you understand how how the, how the urine's formed and, and um, what, what, what is functioning where. And so, um, so I do want you to, to know the order of that and know the process of how, how the urine is formed and excreted. Goodness, it's doing it all over again here. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, yes. Okay, let's just go here. There you go, two slides show. Um, all right, slide. the external content. There we go. I hope it'll stay for a little bit anyway. Okay, so anyway, that's the one that's got all the, the pretty pictures and, and um, I'm pretty sure that one is in, in your book as well. Is it? Have you, know, have you noticed that it's in there? Yes, yeah, 48.2. It's figure 48-2. So it's, it's definitely in there. I knew some of them were and some of them are not. Let me see if I can make this thing work here. Well, now that's fine. I, I guess it was just starting to act up. This is a picture from the, um, the maternal child book, but it's not its not the most recent, so it may not be figure 52 and 1 in the maternal child book, but that's where it came from originally. It's just still a Pearson deal. So you can just see where how the kidneys are, are a little bit um, different, but it tells you which vertebrae. I mean, you don't have to memorize that, but just know that it's in, in the uh, lowest uh, thoracic vertebrae and, and, and then goes down to the are. And then, of course, it's shorter, and they're, they're, they've got a shorter little body and all that sort of thing. Um, one of the things that I did have on page five on the notes page, you can see that I put a whole lot of notes on my notes pages because I used to just try to say that in class and give people an empty outline and then have them just fill it in with what I said. And then you know, different people here at different rates and all that stuff. And so just just by by request from students, some people don't like it, I know, but but uh, by request from enough students that that it really helped. I'm, I'm doing that to benefit the students that it really does help to have have my notes. So I apologize to those of y'all that don't like it done that way, but but at least you you can see the, mm -hmm. the kinds of things that I that I'm thinking about and that I want you to, to be aware of. And sometimes I will say, remember this, and you have to know this. So so it'd be really a good idea to read the pages. So even if I say it out loud, you can read it again when you're studying and realize, yes, I better better know that. One of the things I've noticed in the Giddens book, the concept book, um, is that 
Uh, the urine collection, the bladder, when 250 to 450 mLs is, is um, in the, the bladder at, for adults. And the Giddens book says 300 to 500. So that's another one of those, you know, that's, a, that's from a different company, too. But that doesn't mean that they're wrong. It's just sort of a ballpark, you know, so, and it, everybody's different. So um, some people have a, a lot bigger capacity than others. I tell you, I tell you what, I, I drink a lot. I, I really just drink a lot because it feels good to my throat because I get that drainage. You know, you get this post nasal drip and just and, and coffee and hot tea and Mountain Dew and all that good stuff and <laughs> tastes so good. And and um, the the boy, I, if if I really have to go to the bathroom bad, I could go for ten minutes. I don't know what my capacity is. I would have to check it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, it's just like, you know, it's, I really do have a, I, and I'm sure I've got a more, a whole lot better, bigger capacity than 500, though, when we really get to go. Um, and then, of course, the, it does say that the capacity is 300 to 600 um, in males. That, that is what we're saying that you, you're, you get your urinary desire and everything when you're 250 to 450, but the actual capacity is 300 to 600. And then it's um, um, 50 to 250 for, for a child, and depending on the size and the age, of course. And we'll, we'll um, talk about some of the, the developmental kinds of things, too. Um, and then adults go usually five to six times a day. Of course, that depends on um, how much you drink and what you drink. You can drink things that, that really are sort of diuretic, like coffee and Mountain Dew and Sun Drop and all that, like I do. <laughs> and so, you know, that's a... Um, that makes a difference. And where what you can um, see in your book in, in table 48-2 on page 1310 is the average daily urine output by age. And if you can be familiar with the normals for the different age groups, just ballpark. Um, but, but merge the infant because there's a whole bunch of stages. It, it changes a lot <coughs> in just short periods during infancy. So just uh, merge the infant values to just up to 500 mLs a day by one, one um, year of age. So that, that will do us something. All right, so I'm going to get out of this right this minute. And I'm going to have to get back to Blackboard where I have my video thing stored. And I had it all up and ready. And then this thing crashed, so I didn't get to do that. Um, and I hope that's not going to put you to sleep, but I think those videos are very, very interesting about them. And they're drawing pictures and, and all that kind of thing, and I can't draw with anything. You'd never know if it was a glomerulus if I was trying to draw a glomerulus. What? It is, yeah. Oh, did you see that? Did I have that up there for y'all to see or whatever? But you, you just have seen it before. Oh, yeah, that's what it, that's what went on with yeah. Um, gosh, I don't know why this thing is is on MSN or whatever. Yeah, instead of instead of RCCC, I could change that, but instead of well, um, one of these is called it is on the bladder. Get a little bit of the lid up as it's rising, and really the baby's still not that big. This isn't that big, but the um, the ureters have to have to elongate. They become sort of stretched out to be able to, to compensate for pregnancy and have other other human being in there that's taking that sort of space, and um, can have some um, gestational diabetes with um, pregnancy as well. And you've got glucose in the urine, and it can um, slip into the urine and it can get escape that filtration system. I think that's so cool, the, the way that they explain the, the filtering that the, that the kidneys actually do. And that, it, like if, you're, if you've got a, a strainer and you're trying to, to strain out, like if you've got your macaroni in a pot and you're pouring it out, you pour your macaroni in the, um, in the strainer, then all the water and, and a lot of the slime goes, goes out, but then the macaroni needs to stay. And it's, it's sort of like, it's that, that sort of process. Um, but it, it, it stands <coughs> With, with our body, so it's, it's got that arterial push behind it, and it actually pushes it through this kind of not just the, um, um, it's not, it's not just, just um, by gravity or whatever, it's, it's actually a completely force. So, anyway, the manual filtration rate, you can see what that is now after seeing, you know, seeing <coughs> Those videos, the glomerular filtration rate makes a whole lot more sense, and that's what creatinine clearance is, and that's one of the labs I don't have to look up and be familiar with in your lab book. But um, 
it does increase um, as much as 50 percent from the second trimester to, to birth, and, and that's how much how much is, uh, urine is produced over time because you have to go for for two, and if you've got um, I don't let's see, Lakeisha, I don't know if you saw the the lady at um, I think it was at the very end. You may have already left when we were at Partners in Learning on Saturday. Mm -hmm. There was um, a family that had quadruplets. Did you get mm -hmm. to meet them? No, oh, I didn't. Mean, there were quadruplets. The four little children. It was three, three girls and a boy. And, and I asked somebody was asking the little boy, "Are you the boss?" And all the little girls said, "No." <laughs> Can you imagine having a filter for for four?
strategic about about that because in, in the sense of that is one thing that they can they can really hold over. You know, you may not have time to deal with it, but you have to defend it. Um, so it, it can be um, you, you try to model, and sometimes they just want to they want to do it just like that. You know, they, and and just don't. It, Was uh, showing his son when he was getting getting potty trained and how to how to pee on the wall outside or something. And she's like, no, that's not the modeling behavior we want. How dare this walk or not? But I wouldn't doubt it. Anyway, um, we want to use praise and rewards. You know, we, and we want to um, to to do positive um, reinforcement as much as we can to to, to make them proud of themselves and to reward them. One of the things that we have had on here was like giving them limbs or something, but and that's really not the best thing to do at this day and time with all the talk with obesity and everything. And every time you want to feel rewarded that you need an M&M, and it's like, I'm not sure you love my chocolate. I think I'm going to I might just have death by chocolate, and, and I, I thought that would be what a way to go, I reckon. But, but uh, that's probably not a not our healthiest uh, way to do it, especially because uh, it means have a lot of extra sugar and it's not dark chocolate. And, uh, Oh. 
um, and an antidiuretic hormone being abnormal. You're supposed to um, secrete antidiuretic hormone at night so that it doesn't wake you up to go to the bathroom. But that some people that have problems um, having to go to the bathroom at night or either wetting the bed at night is because they don't conserve the water at night. Um, and that, that just, they just don't have as much antidiuretic hormone as most people do. box and all that. I think that's probably where where we would get that. And, and so you do you do have a tree of that the the, the, um, the kids really should wash their hands before they go to the bathroom if they didn't find outside the earth with their hands and sweep that right. That probably didn't happen very often but it really was a good idea. And of course after they go to the too. So. Okay, elders. Um, this is a whole whole different ball game. There's lots of things that have change with age. But um, we start losing our, our nephrons. Uh, we don't have near, near as many. It starts to go down um, after age three. That's why I said 10 years we should be back on the big road. But if otherwise healthy, though, um, there's usually not um, functional issues until the age of the 90s if you don't have either cardiac problems or, or prostate problems or hormonal issues or you know, that kind of thing. So, um, but the renal function of an 85-year-old is in the note page. It says it's only 50% of a 30-year-old. So the glomerulized sclerosis, what does sclerosis mean? It's getting a heart. So they're not going to filter as well. Um, fibrous changes and atrophy of the blood vessels. What's an atrophy? Shrinking. Yeah, 
and then the proximal tubules um, decrease in number and length too. So, and then cardiac decline can um, um, prevent <coughs> proper filtration in the waste. Why would the heart have anything to do with that? How's it from pump the blood? blood? It's pumping the blood through that filter, and if the pump's not working, then we're not going to have the proper filtration either. <coughs> And then um, they, they take longer to recover from, from illness or surgery, and so the renal function takes longer to recover, too. Um, and, it, and the immunity decreases as, as people get older. So sometimes all those things sort of come crashing in. You put too much stress. You know, everything is, is kind of diminishing um, when somebody gets older. Have you ever seen somebody have, like, a, a fall or something? And there's a whole lot of reasons that people can die after a fall, but, like, pulmonary embolism. don't even know it's there and then you, you go in and slip the next time. I mean, that, that could really, there's all kinds of peripheral issues there that really can, can affect older people. So, so you really, really have to kind of look outside of the box. It's not always some kind of disease process that's really um, profound. It can be just real simple things that cause problems. And, and people, um, older people, I find some of them have a lot of liquids, especially if they're not very mobile, because they know it's going to be difficult to go to the bathroom. You have to go to the bathroom or have to go often, then you're, it's just that's one more opportunity to potentially fall. And some people are, get scared that they're going to fall if they have to get up a number of times. So they're going to, or they'll wait, they'll know that somebody's coming to bring their lunch or something at a certain time. And so they'll, they'll just wait and go to the bathroom then and make sure that they're not drinking a whole lot until somebody's with them and they help them or whatever. So, so a lot of times they don't drink enough, and so they are just susceptible to dehydration. when they're not functioning at, at 100%. So, so um, uh, we had, I had a, I think when I was teaching medications, we did an activity about, um, you know, there was an article about <coughs> a, a study about how many people end up having um, multi-multi, what they call polypharmacy, that was the thing of it, especially with older people, and how dangerous that is, because there's so many people that go back to it, especially if you're not guilty. Okay. Um, only ten minutes. I'll try to get some news or something more. All right. Psychosocial factors are privacy, positioning, and time. Those are really three important words. I, and and y'all were real good with your, you know, like when you're doing injections about I'm going to provide privacy, and, and you positioned your patient for um, 
for you know taking the oral meds, but positioning for, for copying is very, very um, important too. And especially if somebody's used to being in a certain position to, for for um, going to the toilet, um, and then they're not allowed to. Like um, sometimes the, um, people just can't go on the on the med pad. That's just because it's not that's not where they're going. It's not where they're supposed to be. Like their feet on the floor and, and all that sort of thing. So it's like you know, those. probably know this already, but just think about it in, in, uh, in respect of being a nurse. Though. And then our, our fluid and food intake, like alcohol is a diuretic and it increases our output but it causes dehydration to our cells. So, so that can be, be a problem. It inhibits the um, anti-diuretic hormone. And then salt, can, when we talked about salt in the, the videos, that it causes the body to retain the fluid and make you look like you up and all that. So, <coughs> And then some, some foods will change the color or odor of the urine. And um, like beets can make your urine real red. Mm -hmm. And then asparagus, that always they got, that, this is terrible because I, I probably shouldn't admit that I saw, saw this movie, but that, that third um, Austin, Austin Powers movie, did anybody see that? Where, where he's, he's trying, he's got his, he, he unplugged the fountain to have that little boy so drunk, I think it was all the endorphins from all the laughing. I was so dizzy. I felt like I would put the stage to drive home. Like you need sunglasses to look at it. Yeah. Okay, and then um, the the pathological. Something. I'm sorry, I didn't do your slide. No, no, I'm not gonna get to me here. Anyway, that's that's what the, the, um, what the slide was. What I was talking about just then. You know. And then you can have um, changes in your kidneys and your circulatory system and your heart and your blood vessels and even your lungs possibly um, can change your urinary output and your Diseases of the kidney, and you just 
you can do much anything. This one's where that's so important, and I think I skipped that because I think we talked about the pathology one, and I don't think we really got into this one so well. Um, this, this is one that's really, really important. I did not have y'all to do anything in the. But um, I did not give you an assignment in the pharmacology book for this particular unit because it was kind of all over the place with, with some of the, the information. And I think what you really need to know now is, is if you're in PowerPoint or in your book. So, so go by this. You do need to know all of this with these medications, though. So I'll just tell you right now, put a star on there or something that this, this is a very important slide that you need to know. So um, you're going to be asked in clinical how does diuretics work. And, um, if you have Lasix or if you have thiazide, diuretic, um, um, if, well, any kind of diuretic, you may really want to go back to that, um, especially that the first ones, the, the first videos that I showed you, that um, ox or oak cell, or you say a nurse one, where she shows how the filtration works and, and all that and where where um, the, the loop of Henley is. And of course, the, the Khan Academy one it makes it sort of clear too. But, but I think that having those visuals and those graphics that they they grew out um, and really uh, make you understand what's going on there and why is the diuretic working that way because you know, there it's, it's kind of the, sometimes the diuretics are for reducing blood pressure and sometimes it's to reduce swelling and it depends on what you're after um, as to what kind of diuretic that you might use and you might have a combination of diuretics as well. And so we know what the look of Henley is now, right? I mean, I, y'all have that in anatomy, I'm sure, but when you're looking at it as a nurse giving medications, it kind of has a whole different meaning. So it blocks the resorption of sodium chloride if you're doing the loop diuretic, which is Lasix and Humex, or Ferrosamide, I can't remember what Humex is on the generic thing is. Um, the thiazide diuretics work on that, the distal tube to block the sodium reabsorption and increase potassium and water excretion. So what are you going to need to watch for um, the, the um, loop diuretics? And the fact, well, it doesn't even tell you that in this one, but loop diuretics, you can write this down, the loop diuretics also are potassium depleting. It doesn't say that in this particular content source, but, but it definitely does. You do have to watch for, um, for potassium. So, so we're going to be needing to know. That's one reason we're going to have you start noting your labs um, this next week when you're doing your medication because you need to know some of these labs. If you're going to be given Lasix or if you're going to be given a thiazide diuretic or hypochlorothiazide, we, sometimes we classify that as just a blood pressure medicine, but it is, it's a, it is a diuretic. That's how it reduces the blood pressure by reducing the amount of fluid, and that's, that's what the the nurse, the oaks nurse, ox nurse, whatever said um, that that uh, it, the more fluid you have in your in your system, the, the higher your blood pressure is. So you're trying to, to reduce it by getting some of that fluid out, um, and that's that's working in the distal tube. But it does increase the potassium excretion too, and so the, the loop diuretic. But anyway, um, you need to be able to tell your instructor what that what that patient's last potassium level is um, before you give that. Um, that diuretic. That's, that's very, very important. So, so keep that in mind. And there are um, potassium sparing diuretics as well. They work in the distal tubule that allows the sodium excretion but, but um, saves the potassium and retains that in there because you don't, you don't want to get rid of the baby with the bathwater and, um, and that you kind of are with some of the, the, those other diuretics. Um, but they, they don't always work as well. <coughs> so sometimes you'll see a combination of potassium depleting and potassium sparing diuretics. Um, one of those is aldactone. Um, that's a, a potassium sparing, and, and that's not that's not one necessarily that you'll see that that often. But aldactone is a problem. And sometimes you'll see aldactazide, and that is a combination of a thiazide diuretic and a potassium sparing diuretic. So, and then there are some car carbonic anhydrase and osmotic diuretics as, as well. But uh, anyway, when, if you look up your medication that it says it's potassium and sparing, you know, you know, understand what, what's going on there. So, but they, they're not usually the first line because they don't uh, take the fluid out quite as well as the thiazide diuretics do. Okay, so you gotta watch for your hydration because if, if somebody's losing liquid, um, and, um, 
profusely in, um, when they, they uh, go to the bathroom, especially if you give like Lasix IV. Um, people are just going to diuresis, diuresis. Have you heard, you've heard that word diuresis, where you you just go a whole lot. The volume's going to be a whole lot, and so so you've got to. It's a, a simple physical assessment um, that you can do to tell if somebody's dehydrated. Yeah. yeah. What else could you be looking at? Uh, what did you say? Color of the skin. Their mucous membranes. Mucous membranes is what I was after, but you know, all those, those are good. All those are good too. But the, the turgor and looking at whether the mucous membranes are moist. If, if everything's really, really dry, or when the skin appears dry, flaking and all that kind of thing, that certainly would, would uh, be a possibility as well. But the turgor and the skin membranes are quite certainly a part of that. And so we're going to look for our our potassium, our BUN, our creatinine, electrolyte, all of those electrolytes really, but potassium is kind of our major one that what, what happens if you have either too much or too little potassium? It's it it your your heart. Heart. Yeah, it, it's it's toxic to your heart either way, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean it, it can it's because that's a real, real important cardiac um like neurotransmitter to the uh, between the, the nerves and the muscle, um, the heart, the cardiac muscle. So so we're we're really goofing up the heart whether we're whether we're too high or too low. We need to, to have the, the potassium in, in its um, uh, normal range. And I'm not going to expect you to, to have that at this point, but you can look on, on what the hospital's uh, normal range says and and, um, and start getting used to that. It's usually like um, six to or something like that, but it, it may vary from, from uh, machine to machine. You can see what it is on, on your particular uh, unit or your particular hospital there, which whichever um, machine they use it might vary just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and when you do, when you are using potassium sparing diuretics, why would you avoid salt substitutes? Because it's one of the things you're already, your body is already holding on to those salt what is what are salt substitutes mainly made of? Potassium salt. Right, right. And so if you if you've already got something that's sparing the potassium and not excreting the potassium, and then you're adding more um, potassium into the system, that could be you know, if you're not monitoring closely, then that could um, that could certainly be a problem. So okay, and then there we we can have medications that cut that change the color of urine, like um um a Azo is orange. I haven't given that in a long time. I don't even know if we, we, uh, we use that much anymore. But pyridium is a... What's that? About over the counter now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So py pyridium is one that um, that makes your urine really, really, really kind of dark um, orange. And and that's one of those things that I always tell, tell students to teach their patients not to, not to wear their best underwear while they're on the <laughs> pyridium. Because if you lose a little bit, then you're going to ruin your underwear. So it's just keep it. <laughs> um, anyway, um, some some keto drugs cause um, red urine or green urine. There's there's um, a uh, drug called adenomycin, and there's another called adoxyl. Um, and they, those are, are bright red drugs, and they the, the color doesn't change when um, when it's filtered through the, the kidneys or or metabolized by the liver, um, the color just stays red. And so the urine might be um, either pinkish or orangish or, or maybe even red if, it, if they're not very well hydrated. Um, and so that can look disturbing if you see red urine. A lot of times, mm -hmm. when, if you don't see clots in like a photo catheter um, in the bag or the tube, if you don't actually see clots um, in the urine is red, I would just describe it as red because it could be from a, a, a food Unless you see clots, you don't really know that it's blood necessarily. So, um, and the, there is a, a drug that's similar to adrenomycin. It's like a, it's like a, um, a chemical that's used to, I think it's used in like textile processing or something like that. But, but um, it's called mitoxantrone, and um, and it's bright, bright um, blue. It al almost looks black in the vial, but then when you dilute it, it's this gorgeous royal blue color. Angela would like that. <laughs> but, but it makes the urine green. So, because if you, you know, yellow plus blue makes plus. Okay. You're going to have green. That looks very strange. So, 
can cause urinary retention and that can be that can be a problem for especially because there are a lot of these are over the counter like Benadryl um, uh, and some anti other antihistamines and all over the counter and that can cause urinary retention in some people and it'll tell you that on the package insert a lot of times people don't read that and, and don't don't uh, realize that if they've already got some retention problems that that could be exacerbated and can see the end of uh, decongestancy and then um, atrophy Blood pressure meds, opioids, all of those can, can potentially cause retention in there. There is some, some more explanation on page 1309. We'll just move on from there. But, but um, whatever, whatever is on this slide in the, in the notes page is certainly fair game for y'all to, to be knowing. Okay, and so we, with our pathology, I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but anything that can affect your flow can, can affect um, your output. But the dehydration we talked about or the kidney or, or um, your regular stones or um, your regular stones, you can have any urine in the tract, or bladder stones, you have those sometimes too. Um, and then of course um, tumors and, and injuries and all that, I think we did um, get into that. And, and um, then we talked about that that filtration system is not supposed to to filter out proteins or, or uh, blood cells. And if you see blood cells in the urine, there may be some, some issues with um, how well the, the uh, filter is, is working and if, it's, um, if things are damaged, if the filter is, is stretched to where it's letting big molecules like that through. So that's that's not good. Um, and then um, with with surgery and the anesthesia, we can talk about that too. And I had a coworker that had a C-section because they ran out of the in the recovering room, so they just brought her up to ICU for us to monitor. She had spinal anesthesia, but um, I ended up working with her later. But, but she was having, you know, with it was spinal anesthesia, you're, you're numb um, from, you know, whatever level that they put the, put the spinal anesthesia in and down. And so she we had to wait until she was able to um, get her bladder and notice that her, her bladder was full and all that cool to let her go. You know, you almost know, back on the and all. And then um, we had the catheter for long term board. And a lot of times women that have a lot of babies have, have problems because the problem doesn't have um, this decrease with the with extra um, extra weight and and, um, and all the all the stretching and, and um, childbirth going on. So and that can that can certainly be be permanent. Okay, so on our our next slide, these are some, some problems with urine, urine production. So poly means what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and this was in this, this case it's overproduction. So it's, it's too much. So what that can make you have um, decreased thirst and dehydration and weight loss. And then polydipsia, that means with um, gypsy, um, a lot of people just say say thirst, but it is increased thirst. Uh, and that, that can happen with diabetes and and Oleg urine, have you ever heard of Oleg as a prefix? What does that mean? It's just, it's just too little, it? it's just low. It's, in that, in this this um, perspective, it's low output. Um, it can be due to dehydration, but usually for, from poor renal function. And then the anuria, when you have to say A or an, that's, that's none, pretty much, yeah. And it's almost always due to the, to the renal disease. And then, um, uh, there's hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, so um, that, that can be a, um, one of the treatments for, well, that's really all you can do to, to be able to mimic the, um, as well as you can, the, the function of the kidney. So, um, you need to remember these terms, because you're going to see here, 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 and 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 so you might, you might find something new, but right now we want you to know those terms. And um, 
page 13 and 11 does have, have some, some more information about these terms as well, the factors associated with altered urinary elimination. So, um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Oliguria, do know this for real short. The oliguria is less than 30 mL an hour. And, or, or 524 hours. So that's, that's a real important milestone to be thinking about. When, um, when I was working at Duke um, first year out of nursing school, I went to it was in an old Duke hospital before they took the kids and that's all you know, but, but, mm -hmm. but at least it's the, the old Duke hospital. Um, I was working on a surgical unit and you, you could just get about anything in there. But we, we had three rooms that we could make like an ICU room or like a one-on-one -on -one room and we would have the kidney transplant patients would come to our floor and the uh, clinician, while the patient was in surgery, the clinician would come up and help the nurse that was going to be assigned to that patient to prepare the room and everything. And that was, we had to just every hour, every hour, every hour check the urine out. But if it was less than 30, it was just like an emergency. We'd have to send them to, to get um, fixed dialysis and, and, uh, because they're, they didn't, their, their kidneys weren't functioning uh, well. And so Okay, and then hemodialysis is when, when you're hooked up by a, a shunt or a, a special catheter, a special central catheter to, um, to take the, the blood to, um, a semi, through a semi-permeable membrane outside of the body and, um, and then, then um, filter it and then, then send it uh, back into the, the bloodstream. Um, and when you have um, one of those shunts, it's an arteriovenous shunt, um, they, it, has, um, it has a funny feeling. And that's one of the things, if you have a patient that does have, have one of those, you have to protect it at all costs. No needle sticks on that side. It's like having a mastectomy or something. You don't need blood pressure, you don't need needle sticks, anything on the right <coughs> side. And then you also have to, to monitor it and feel the, the place where the shunt is made. They do a surgical procedure to to like join the artery and the vein so that they can um, um, use it for the, for the dialysis procedure. And um, a lot of times they, those will fail and they'll sort of wear out and I'll have to put it in another than the other arm and then, then they'll end up having to do another another route, uh, um, like a, the central kind of line. But anyway, when you have the peripheral arteriovenous shut, you need to feel, they call it a thrill, it feels like electricity. Has anybody ever felt that before? Yeah, so it feels like they got electricity running through, doesn't it? When, you know, not, it's not, it's different than when you're just feeling a pulse. You're feeling, it's just like an electrical shock almost when you touch it. it? And if, or is there a better way to describe it? Um, but they call it thrill. Anyway. I know, it feels like really a pounding pulse. And it feels it's like very it's forceful, isn't it? Yeah. And you even hear it. And it's like it, vi it makes it sort of vibrate, doesn't it? It's so strong that it makes the, the tissue vibrate. I guess that's why it's a, a, the, the, the thrill. But it, it, it's, so, it's hard to describe it until, it's, until you actually feel it. But if anybody does have a patient with a, a shunt like that, let your other um, clinical group uh, members know because, and let, let them feel that because it is really, it's really interesting. But, but if you lose that thrill, that means it's not working and they need to go on and get something taken care of so that when a patient needs dialysis, it can't have an access to, to get in. So you can't just put it in the bank um, and, and work that way. So, and, and then the um, peritoneal dialysis, um, a lot of people are doing that at home. There's even some people that can talk to do the, the um, dialysis at home too. But um, it, the fluid goes in the abdomen and the peritoneal membrane actually does, does the filtration along with the, the, type, the electrolytes that they put into the, the um, um, distillate, I guess you call it, um, that, that you, you instill into the, into the peritoneal ca cavity through a, through a catheter that goes, goes into the peritoneal cavity. And that has to, to be um, kept sterile. Um, so we don't, certainly don't want, because that peritonitis is, is a deadly kind of thing. We certainly don't want to introduce any germs into the peritoneal cavity because that's just, that's why people die um, like uh, um, ruptures in the, in the colon or, um, or ruptured appendix and all that kind of thing because the peritoneum is supposed to be sterile and when your peritoneal gets that shock of organisms in there, it's literally deadly and actually how people die. Um, same thing if we introduce nerves into our appearance of dialysis procedure. So we really, really, really got to teach the patients how to, to keep them 
everything sterile. Uh, but they, they put the fluid in and it goes, they, it goes across the membrane and exchanges some of it, the toxin electrolytes and everything, and then um, the drain it out kind of thing. It's like you do it still over a certain period of time, it dwells in the abdomen for a certain period of time, and then, then um, you expel it into a, um, into a, a catheter bag or other receptacle. And uh, so people on dialysis may get, you may see some urine output, but it's not the building properly. We have a little bit out there. So, okay. Now, um, frequency is greater than six times a day, which is the definition of it. And so, urinary tract infections and diabetes and pregnancy <coughs> uh, all cause that. But also, if you drink a lot of fluid, it's going you know, to like to drink fluids, or if you drink a lot of fluids that, that are diuretic, like coffee and something else, and all that kind of stuff, and all that. I do drink a lot of water, too. So. I hope I can justify that. But nocturia, um, and you know, like nocturnal, is, is greater than two times a night. And, um, and then urgency is the, uh, you know, you know, they ask you, I go to that, 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 that's what we're talking about, urgency. And that, that can be good if you have rotation in your urinary tract, or of course, finger control, or um, bladder spasm, stress. Dysuria, what's dys mean? It can be pain or bad or, yeah, it's, it's just a bad word, isn't it? So pain or burn, burning, um, and that could be a, a stricture, which is a narrowing, um, and, um, and or, or stones, and, and then hesitancy can go along with that sometimes, too, where you, it kind of, it's hard to start the urinary stream. You see that a lot of times with um, benign prostatic hypertrophy in older men. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, um, your urogenic bladder is when that the patient's incontinent um, or have overfilling of the bladder or incontinent to get to the bladder. I've seen um, patients with MS um, have to catheterize themselves because their bladder is not functioning properly. That's like a neurogenic bladder. Uh, the nerve endings are not um, connected to the muscles of the bladder, so that we don't know that the bladder's full, and so they just have to to empty their, their bladder at specific um, in intervals with your catheters. And I'll work out mm -hmm. uh, to show you after a while. We'll, we'll send around and show and tell in a while. But um, definitely look at the um, table 483 and select the factor associated with all the urine contamination. So, um, yeah. And um, urine And the, at the bottom where it says alteration in treatments, um, that that's one of the ones that I missed that was in the old slide, and that's, that there was a chart on that. Um, the, this book used, puts the treatments in the toward at the end of the chapter, and so that's that's not a, that, so you can scratch that out on the um, on that uh, notes page. And, but the uh, production and, and um, if there's alterations in production and elimination, the section is is just a narrative in the book, um, 1310 and 1311. So just that's what you need to study instead of that. We don't have that same chart anymore. In this book. And I missed. I don't know where I was. I must have been in the zone. That's right either. This page. I missed that page. It's, it's 1313 is the page number you need now. Um, that's where the, the assessment is discussed. It's not. Um, it's not just a chart. I and mean, it has some. Um, pictures and directions and things too, but it also has some narrative. But we also want, we always want to do our, our history, um, what, what's your normal wording pattern, and has it changed recently, all those kind of things. And I think that y'all really, um, um, probably would just suggest that I'm going to go on, because you've really had this before, we're just doing it in the context of urinary tract information. So, so um, that y'all can certainly read through that kind of question, but you know, I don't think we need to, I don't think we really read that to you. And then um, in, the, in the health history and the interview and all that kind of thing, when you talk about what they're eating and uh, where they're working, especially um, exposure to toxic chemicals. And that's, does anybody know why that would be significant for the urinary tract? It's what? Yes, exactly. That is, that there is an association between the chemical exposure and bladder cancer. Smoking also influences bladder cancer too. That, that you know, we all know about the lungs, the bladder cancer they may have uh, shown a 
relationship with our soil. Um, the other thing here, though, on this notes page, the, I, I have it on here. Really need to know this <laughs> um, uh, as far as on the notes page, the characteristics of normal urine, and that's on that table 48-4 on page 1314. And um, so those are tells you what's normal, and then when we have normal, um, but what's normal is is that we, we do have 96% water typically, and most of the most hydrated and so concentrated, and then 4% solutes. So our, our organic, we have organic and inorganic, the urea and ammonia and creatinine and uric acid are all, all organic, and then inorganic is, is like the, the sodium, the chloride, potassium sulfate, and magnesium, and, um, and phosphorus. I think that potassium and sulfate, well I guess that's okay. <clears throat> Maybe that's supposed to have another comma, but potassium and sulfate are, are, are extremely as well. I'm just, what do you think about um, work Oh, um, if, they, if they're if they exposed to, to toxic chemicals, okay. that could be a risk factor for bladder cancer, and so could okay. smoking. Yeah, and our other tobacco use. Yeah. So, so anyway, you can see that the um, work and the work is Especially in intensive care or units, you're going to see that. But if somebody's a fresh post-op patient, even if they're not, even if they don't have a strict no order, it's probably a good idea to do with that <laughs> because um, you really need to know if, if what goes in and is even one of those what goes out. And that can be frustrating to students when they're trying to look it up in the computer and, and somebody has not documented it for over the 24 hour period, you're, you're just you know, kind, of, kind of lost as to what what's going on, but it, it really is a good idea on somebody who's fresh post-op to do that too. Um, and then when you're measuring from a urine drainage bag, some of y'all have done this a million times, but for those of you that have it, you need to have a graduated container. You don't look at the bag and, then, and say, this is 200. That's just an eyeball sort of thing, and it depends on how much urine's in there as to how much it stretches out. And it's like that in IV bags too. You don't, you can say, well, I can eyeball it, it's about 500 cc in there or whatever, but but um, you really do measure what's in the, in the bag in the graduated um, container. And what's, what's the easiest to find usually on the floor is, is a urinal. But um, there are also usually some little cups that you can get something small. Um, there's a small amount of urine that you can get in the graduated cup. Sometimes people have little enough urine that you might can even use a little medicine cup. That's, that's really bad bad news if, that, if you can measure the map. But that, you know, that may be your best way to measure it if you don't really have any. So you need to have 1,200 to 1,500 is like a normal volume. If it's less than um, 1,200, that's bad. The, the good is the is where it's not not bolded, and the bad is when it's um, is, 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 is the bolded. And the color should be clear, straw to amber, transparent. And if it's, if it's bad, it's dark cloudy, um, um, orange, red, or brown, or thick, or obviously got like seven in it. And um, sometimes it's sometimes it's cloudy. Not because of infection. Maybe it's cloudy because it's been sitting there a long time and they've been to it for one thing, but there, there can be other reasons for it to be cloudy because you, you might suspect infection when it is there. And, um, you know, the, the urine does have sort of a, it, ha it has an odor kind of dependent on what you eat for one thing, but um, especially we talked about. Got that yesterday. The asparagus is one that really does, does change it. And sometimes, it, sometimes um, if you ever, Coffee drinkers, if you if you drink a lot of coffee and you go to the bathroom, you smell coffee. I mean, it goes, it does smell good. Um, come through, according to what you need. But if it's, if it's really, if you're smelling the patient and they smell like ammonia, what might be going on there? The patient smells like ammonia. Got a blockers or something. Or, they, or they've been incontinent or something mm -hmm. and there's, there's urine on their skin and on, or on their clothes or in their bed clothes. And They probably didn't lie in a long time if it's likely to be, be that small, small too. And sometimes people that, that have, have become 
you know, lost their cognition and everything, and they, they just happen to be taking care of themselves at home, and they come in like to the emergency room or whatever, that's, that's when you may really notice that strong ammonia smell of somebody that's been incontinent and just not, not been cognitive enough, or their cognitive status isn't um, well enough for them to even know that, that, that they needed to change their clothes or, or whatever. So that's, that's <coughs> again, in the nursing home, a lot of the patients that are hydrated, they have a smell. Yeah. So, Yeah, I know that's a shame too because that, that it is difficult to, to keep people clean sometimes, but it, it really means that. But, I mean, they can be clean. I'm, I've got one particular patient. We can take her to the shower and, and take her back to the room and change her, and she's done. So her, she has ammonia smell even. Oh, and you know that, well, there is ammonia in the no end, it, but it just is really strong if it's, if it's been sitting a long time. But yeah, they, they may just have their chemistry, they be such that it just they just produce that, that ammonia um, immediately. Okay, and then we should have, our urine should be sterile, um, with no microorganisms. That's, that's the ideal, but we know realistically that our anus is really close to the urethra in, in women in particular. Um, and so, so there, sometimes they're, they're producing some of those um, um, stool germs from the stool coming up into the urinary tract. So, and we want to um, not have uh, microorganisms in our urine when we're looking at our analysis. And then our pH is is um, 4.5 to 8. That can be according to what you eat or what how what kind of nutrition that you're getting. Um, a lot of people with um, uh, sugar spilling out into the urine have have and that. And specific gravity, that's sort of in school, but it's easier for you to remember. But um, the way they they did it um, when I I learned it was 1.003 to 1.030. That was just really cool. 03 and then 30, that was easy to remember. They've got 10 to 25. Um, 10 to 1 to 1 .0, But um, I still remember the 30, 3 to 30, and that's what it's like for um, the stack of my mind. But it's the density compared to water I mentioned that yesterday. And the higher the concentration of the urine, the higher the specific gravity will be. It'll be, more, it'll be less like water. Um, and then we don't want any glucose in there. That's what's normal. And then ketone bodies, we don't want it. The presence of ketones is indicative of uncontrolled diabetes or starvation. Somebody with uncontrolled diabetes is starving. Their cells are starving. And so you break down uh, proteins and fats and, and you get ketones or uh, bodies, that right um, And then we don't want blood in there. But sometimes you'll see blood in, um, in specimens if, if someone's having a menstrual scare. If they've got a public catheter, it should have the contact with the, with the vagina with the vaginal area but um but if they if they are doing like a clean catch they're still i've had that happen to me before when i had red blood cells in there it's like uh you know, like right into my period you can't couldn't see the cells but they could see it under the microscope so okay assessing urine um there there is a uh, there's lots of skills in this book we last year we had a separate book to read out of and then another book to do to look at the skills of pictures and this is all combined. So uh, measuring urinary urinary uh, urinary output is 13, 13, 13 14 and measuring residual urine is only 15 and then the and and clearance. And that's I'll give you a sign. If y'all have a different um, lab book than what other people have but some of y'all had asked if we get like in the summer if I could use it at a different edition or whatever. But just look up BUN creatinine creatinine clearance in those in, in whatever lab book you have because that should tell you the, the same uh, type of information. So um, okay. So measuring you need to wear gloves definitely and then make sure you're measuring at eye level just like you do when you were measuring your liquid in your um doing specimens and also I'll put some pages from that, um, 820 and 8 to 826, collecting how to collect urine specimens of different sorts, the clean catch versus just a um, regular specimen and how to how to take it out of a catheter. We're going to show you some of those things in, in the layout later on too. 
Um, residual urine um, is what's left in the bladder after emboli, um, and the normal is um, 50 to 100 ml. And um, states, that's what states is in. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <coughs> Like static, just not, not, not really not just, I was just sitting there. So just sitting in there in the bladder with a retention, and so the stasis and infection can um, cause the, the amygdala lifting. And um, so if if you um, have more than 100 mLs um, residual, then then that's that's um, abnormal. Now a lot of times um, after surgery um, or after somebody's had a catheter removed. Um, the doctor will say um, either do a, do a catheterization, just an in and out cap and see what the residual is, or do, what's the other thing you can do to see how much is in there? Bladder scan. Bladder, bladder scan. scan, right, right. So a bunch of y'all probably, have, how many people have done bladder scans before? I bet a lot of them have. And so that, that um, determines the, um, whether they, they need a you know, in and out cap. But why would you maybe rather do a bladder scan than, than automatically do an in and out cap? Infection. Infection. Yes, yeah, so it's certainly a risk for infection. Every time you put a hard object up in the urethra, for infection. Exactly. So, um, anyway, with the residual, um, we we um, definitely want to prioritize doing the bladder scan if that's possible. Now, if the doctor just absolutely says that's what you got to do, don't you know, just just go in and do an in and out cap. Um, then I, you just have to do it. But if, it, if they leave it to, up to nurse and judgment, then nurse and judgment would be to do which? Bladder scan. Bladder scan, yes, yes. And that's not invasive. It's, um, it's actually like a, um, it's, it's like a sonogram type of thing of, of the, until it um, estimates how much is left in the bladder. So it's really, um, just using the same way as what they are. Um, but anyway, the, the PUN is a byproduct of protein metabolism, and so that's, that's blood, urea, nitrogen, you know, proteins have nitrogen in them, and so, um, and that can, that one can vary with hydration, though, because sometimes you may see a patient come in, they, they've been lying in the floor for, for 24 hours, and then somebody primes them and brings them to the hospital, and their original BUN is way out the roof, and then they start an IV, and the next, the next reading is like half that much, so that's because it is definitely tied to hydration. Who had a hand up over here? Okay, yeah, Lakeisha. What did you say about the BUN or the byproduct? Of protein metabolism. Of protein metabolism. Yep. That's 5 to 25. And um, let's see, the creatinine is, is, um, is like the glomerular filtration. How well is your, are your kidneys filtering um, the, the urine or the blood? Is it filtered? And the creatinine clearance um, measures how much creatinine is filtered um, through your kidneys, like a 24 hour period. And that involves filtering 24 hour urine and keeping it during cold. Um, and then there are your creatinine, the blood creatinine, and they can put that in the formula and see, get a good guess as to what the real familiar filtration rate is. And that's one of the things that um, that you you may see for, for dosing um, medications. A lot of chemo drugs now are being being done through they call it area under the curve, but you have to um, be watching the renal function. And, and um, some of y'all know uh, some of the drugs that they do peaks and troughs in the hospital. Have y'all heard heard about that? What what kind of drugs are being tested? Yeah, aminoglycosides and, and vancomycin. You can see that a lot. So, did y'all this might have another one? I don't know if y'all heard about it. Okay. All right. So, all right, and now um, the, the urine testing, um, let's get a page because I'm going to back up a lot of little bit of a size. So, if I skip a little bit. But uh, you can do just a random collection, a clean, a clean catch, or a midstream collection. Um, sterile or timed, and the time could be like over the 24 hours where you have to, to empty every bit of urine and you, you have to avoid in one of those packs in the floor. Um, and I did that one time for the nurses' health. I'm involved in the, the 
second cohort in the nursery, nurses health study, and they just collect a lot of information from thousands and thousands of nurses all over the country. And, and then they save the, the specimens so that if we get some kind of disease later in life and we report that to them, then they can go back and look at what our labs were when we were younger and see, see what, if the pattern started earlier so they can kind of see um, what, what people may need to look for to, to try to, to um, have more, more kind of preventive medicine and health promotion. So anyway, um, look in that chapter 34 for how to do those specimen collections. I think y'all can learn more things like how that, that works. So it's kind of sort of a, a layout thing. But anyway, when, when you are um, looking at, at trying to do this with children, it's really difficult. This is old. I'm sure they, they probably have made them better. Everything keeps getting better as far as the, the process. We probably had these for years. But this is one that was meant for, for a child um, or a, a, an infant. And this is what I had to put on Sarah when she had her symptoms and everything. We didn't know if she had a urinary tract infection or not. And kept falling off, falling off, falling off. <laughs> that, that sticky stuff just doesn't stick to mucous membranes real well. But... Um, but anyway, we finally got the specimen and found out, yeah, that, that is what it was. But I will pass some of these, several of these things around after a while because I've got several other things too. Uh, but it's, it can be very difficult to, to get that um, specimen. Um, and if, um, if you're trying to get a specimen, you know, like I said, you're going into a little half of a toddler, somebody is party trained, uh, or preschool kids, sometimes that they, uh, they don't want to be on the main, they're going to go on the main, they want to do it. So um, you may want to give them a drink or not. One specimen, they sure the page is not dehydrated. Use the terms they understand. Don't say urinate. <laughs> uh, Lois urinate. <laughs> She's not going to know what to do. So you can call it whatever they call it. Or or whatever. So, um, and then what What we want to um, look for is if there's um, the, if the color is abnormal, um, if it's dark red, that's usually old, older blood. But then again, it could be from something that you know, eating like drugs too. So you know, from the same unless you see clots. Um, and then bladder bleeding would be if you're dark red with kind of clots. And then um, you may have the meds and food causing some changes as well. And if it's, if it's um, sort of tea colored, like dark, dark colored tea, you're on But then if it's clear at the time of warning, it can become cloudy just because it's, sit, it's sat for a long time and then um, it, the, it's not really a, um, a very helpful uh, um, assessment or evaluation for um, the, what's going on if it's, sit, it's sat a long time because it, it, it does change, it has chemical changes in it as it sits. And so you want to get, get the, the urine samples to the lab just as soon as possible after you collect it so that it's not going to be it's, it's not going to change, and you either have to refrigerate it or get it to the lab ASAP. So, um, some of this is repetitive, but common urine test, your analysis specific rather than your urine culture, and then your lab book assignment is one of them, a lot of that. And the first morning specimen in the morning is the best. That's what we do with print. And then, here's the And that way, the bladder's been empty. script for the doctor's offices do that first and then they'll if, if it's fine they don't, don't do a further test. But it's like one plus two plus three plus according to, to colors for glucose and ketones and, and um, blood blood cells and stuff like that. That's a qualitative test, not quantitative, so it's not it just tells it about the presence. And sometimes it'll be positive like for, for protein, but what you might find out if you do a microscopic on that for analysis is the protein is actually Um, 
um, what they would want to do is before, if they suspect a urinary tract infection, you want to make sure that you've gotten the culture before you start antibiotics. We're gonna, you're going to hear this over and over again, but you want to, to, to have a culture done before antibodies are started because you're not going to be able to, to really see what's going on or what was going on if you, if you get a broad spectrum antibiotic um, and then take that test. You may want to do that a few weeks later to make sure that the infection is clear. But you, know, if you really need to know the, the organism when it's a really bad infection. You want to get the broad spectrum. Just as, a, just as a guess to, okay, let's cover everything we can think of at this point, but with a, just a general broad spectrum, but there may be another one on the culture and the sensitivity, they'll, they'll actually grow it in the fish and then see which antibiotics kill it the best, which ones they're most sensitive to, and then they'll, uh, they'll change the meds if the broad spectrums are not, um, not the best for the sensitivity test. And then um, in, in uh, kidney disease, you may have foaming urine, um, or cloudy because of the high protein concentration. And then if it's bacteria, it's going to be more you know, syrupy like. And then uh, odor, it's going to have those that are going to be used as an as usual environment. Thing. But my kidney said that's not always the case. It may just be that, um, that, that patient's head got so. All right. Why don't we come back in for 20 to your
to things that they were not allergic to in the past or we didn't know that they were anyway um, and, it, and you know, don't ever know when that will, will happen. That's the same thing with antibiotics just because they're not allergic to an antibiotic. At the time that you ask them on admission, they, they could, um, the next dose might be the one that, where their budget overflows. That's what my mother-in-law said. She, <coughs> she, she fell out to the floor um, at a foundation, um, a hospital foundation um, dinner that shellfish, she'd only eat like a couple bites it would make her break out. And so she would just eat a couple of bites. And if she ate too much, then it would make her have a worse rash and she'd say her bucket would overflow. Well then, that that time she she just totally fell out. I guess she just became hypotensive and everything. And they um, they thought she was having cardiac issues and all that. But they, but, uh, she, uh, they finally determined that it, it was the, the shellfish allergy. So she can't that anymore. And that's either one of them. Um, peanuts but anyway, we have to have to repeat assessing and then observe knowing that he may cause a vegetable reaction in some people just because they don't already have an allergy doesn't mean you're home free. So, and, and some other ones are called uroflowmetry, or I don't know if that's the way to say that, systematography. All those are, are um, like bladder capacity measures for when people have, um, have problems with retention or, um, or recontinence. And then cystoscope is the invasive procedure that you do have to be... Um, uh, prepped for that, and you, you do have to um, have conscious sedation so that they're not going to put you under um, general anesthesia like an operator, and they're going to give you like a uh, versus or something like that to, um, to, to be able to, to tolerate the, the procedure. Because it is, it is uh, uncomfortable, and it's just the idea of it is uncomfortable too for a lot of people. It's embarrassing and all that. But that's anytime you see scope at the end, that means they're. What, what patients would always say in our office, they're, they went in with the light, or they're going in with the light. So they, they go, that's what they're doing. They, they do put a, um, a tube in and, and, um, and then look, look with the light. And sometimes they can even, if there's a tumor or, or some abnormality there, or like polyps or something, they can remove it just like in, in colonoscopies, they can remove like colon polyps inside. So uh, with the study. What, what may be the cause of the incontinence. And then this is in, in the, your book. It's called Toileted Contributive Factors. It's actually really about the same thing as 
I have it on a, a, one of these other slides. It's called diapers. It's really about the same thing um, that is in the mind of just sort of remember what kind of things can cause um, or be associated with with incontinence. So, um, but, in, but anyway, um, um, acute is transient, meaning that, that if you can find the cause and treat it, then it's going to go away and you won't have a problem anymore. But then the chronic means it's established and, and it's not not likely to ever go away, especially like in those in the uh, kind of thing you can't, um, can't fix the problem. But um, the big, big thing, and I've got this in bold on the, on the, the uh, nose page, is that, that incontinence is a symptom, it's not a disease. Now, it can be a nursing diagnosis, but it's not it's not a disease within itself, and it is not a normal consequence of aging. Yes, if people that, that are older have a greater risk for it, but it's still not normal. It isn't just because you're old doesn't mean it's normal to be incontinent. So just sort of separate that in your mind. Yes, if, yes, the older people have greater risk, but it is not normal to, to have incontinence. <coughs> so, okay. But anyway, it is more prevalent in women than men, probably because of the child bearing and the whole muscle issue. Um, and, and then, of course, women live longer than men, too. So, um, and then people that, that smoke have higher risk as well, that they have bladder spasms, or, or blood vessel issues, too, with smoking. Yeah. And um, if you're, you're not, um, if your cardiac function is not, and your vessel system is not functioning properly, then, then your, your urinary tract may not function properly. In the long term. So, anyway, acute can be reversible, and then the chronic um, you know, may not be. So, with the acute, like you've got a fecal impaction or, or uh, that your mobility is a problem right now, but like you're just recovering from a hip replacement and then you are able to get up and walk around later, then that, that could be reversible. Um, and if you've got some sort of a cognitive problem that, that can be, be reversed or, or a stress problem that. Um, So, and also um, hypercalcemia, because that can, can cause you to go to the bathroom a whole lot, and that, that can make some people incontinent, they'll get more incontinent before because of the great volume. Your body's trying to get rid of that extra calcium, and it uh, gives you a white urine output. So, and in pregnancy, we already talked about <coughs> volume overload, like if you got congestive heart failure, um, that, that can be an issue as well. Um, and um, in uh, and diuretics temporarily um, <coughs> in great quantities, that, that can cause some, some um, overload as well in, for the bladder capacity. And then obesity and diabetes can contribute as well, too. But if, if you get those things controlled, then it's <coughs> okay. Okay, the, the big thing is under this chronic, I, I just had that word on the, the notes page denial, just kind of sitting out there. But um, a lot of times when you um, ask people if they're having any trouble with their urinary function, they'll just say no. Are you having any trouble? No. Well, a lot of people deny that they have incontinence. They don't want it. They've got it under control. They, they're not, not under control, but they, they're doing things about it, just like not leaving home if they don't have to, or uh, you know, wearing briefs or, or wearing pads or something like that to catch it, and they, they just... They just live with it. Is they're, they're living with it. They don't see this problem. They think it's a normal consequence of aging. So you need to really um, say, do you have to wear a pad to, to catch and do the urine and, and that sort of thing. You need to ask them that specifically. Um, and that, that way, you know, they still can lie to you. But if, you know, if you ask them specifically, then you know, they'll really come clean and let you know. And then you can let um, the, the primary care um, know what that is and, um, and order some of the proper testing. And maybe give them some medication or, or therapies that will help them. Okay, so um, now the, what, what we um, we are looking at as well is urinary retention is our other our other exemplar, and that can be because the, the bladders the bladder muscles are, are weak, and you're, that's what when it's uh, contractility is poor. That means that the muscles are weak and, and they're not doing their job. And, um, and then like prostate enlargement, and, and um, I mentioned this a while ago, but you're going to see BPH a lot, BPH, BPH, and you're going to see some medications that are for BPH. Um, anybody know what that is? BPH, benign atrophy. Yeah, what does that mean? It's hypertrophy, that means it's overgrown. 
So it is it's a enlarged prostate. And, that, and that's when it's benign, that means it's not cancerous. It's just that um, in, in older men, that their, their, um, their prostate tends to, to enlarge. And sometimes that can, can squeeze because the, the urethra goes through the prostate. If you look at your anatomical picture of the, of the male urinary tract, you can see that the urethra goes right through the prostate. And so the prostate's enlarged. It may not just enlarge outward, it may enlarge inward too. And then you've got That's a that's a big deal. We're going to go into those um, chronic um, types of, of uh, uh, <clears throat> incontinence as, as well a little bit. And then the neurogenesis um, <coughs> they they don't know that they have it. Or, uh, down in the It's not in the book anymore, but but um, total means that you're you're not that you're incontinent in, in all of these ways. That if everything's um, all of those things are present. So, so that's really just that kind of a, that's the garbage can of everything that's thrown in there um, one time. So so functional means that somebody just can't get to that one or whatever reason, and maybe you know, an immobility issue or. Or cognitive, it's not that their bladder's abnormal or anything, but that they, they can't sense that it's full, they, they just may not be able to get there. But dementia, impaired mobility, diuretic, sedation, depression, regression, um, uh, then that can be from all kinds of different causes. So, so that's functional, they just can't get to the bathroom for whatever reason. And then reflex is um, that urine starts leaking out when a certain volume, when you get to a certain volume in, um, of urine in the bladder. And if you haven't emptied your bladder um, before that, that point, then um, it's going to leak and you may not even realize that. You're going to realize you're going to go. And then stress, this is the one that a lot of people have, especially the postmenopausal women, is it's like sneezing, coughing, laughing, um, um, lifting, that that's on um, when you're actually um, sort of straining, then then that that's when um, the, the the stress incontinence can happen, and um, that that means that there, there's decreased urethral resistance, and the, the sphincters may not be, or especially the the um, external sphincter is not not real competent. Um, so the weak muscles and the weak urethra need in the sphincter. And then, um, so complete inability to hold urine is a total loss of control in all situations and positions. Okay, and third is a, gotta go now, gotta go now, gotta go now. Um, and then I think there's a diagnosis in, in the uh, fundamental, but like risk for urge in the I don't know why they have to add that in there too, but you can have risk for lots of things. But sometimes this NANDA thing, you're like, what, what are they? Why do they do that? Do it for this, but not for another diagnosis? So I guess everybody gets a vote and they just get to do their favorite thing or whatever. But just like, uh, okay, disturb energy field. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's what we talked about in our, our pre-conference. There is actually a diagnosis, or at least it was last year. They've updated it, and I don't remember if it's still on there or not. Disturb energy field is a nursing diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Stay out of my mother. Um, but anyway, the, the urge incontinence is more of a spasm. It could be a spasmodic sort of thing where you're, you're having some spasms and it's making it leak out and it's harder to control it. 
Um, and as soon as you have to go, it's it's just it is urgent. As soon as you realize, like if you you're sitting down and then you stand up and then it's just urgent and you're gonna you just leave before you can get to the bathroom. So um, that's not an inability to get to the bathroom. It's just that you're going to get there quick enough if you um, um, change positions or whatever. And then overflow, it has to do with attention too. But um, sometimes you can overflow incontinence is that if you have attention, you don't even realize that you're that full. All right, and so this next one is that same thing with toilet that I often read over that. It's in the book with the toilet that the diapers is very similar. It's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. This is one that was made me a long time ago, but I thought it was kind of interesting to, to have that there. But diapers is a little insulting, in this, so, uh, especially for adults. Well, anyway, um, the, in, in retention, the pressure in the bladder, it, 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 it exceeds the origin of the population. In continence, and the, um, the pressure um, exceeds the original resistance. So, um, uh, I think we've already discussed all the potential things in the part of the disease can cause the incontinence. Uh, and then the ability to urinate, inability to, to avoid urinating, increased rate of urination, is leakage uncontrolled with infrequent bladder infections. This is all talking about incontinence. Um, and then reversible within the pH, atrophy of the urethra, vagina, UTI impaction, all those, those things in acute confusion can, can, um, can be, it can be um, relieved in some cases, sometimes maybe not. And then the nerve conditions, um, the epistadious absence of the upper wall in the urethra, that can usually be, be clear with surgery, but, but some, in some cases it might not be able to, but in the neural tube defect, that can be Okay, now let's get into the treatments. Medicines. Now these are, this is very important. And again, I did not tell you to read from the oncology book. Um, but I did want you to know this page. So, copper needle um, controls the smooth muscle of the bladder neck for mild stress incontinence. And it's an antidepressant. And know that it can cause drowsiness. So you have to worry about whether you drive or not. Um, it's typically taken at night. So, so if we ask you an application question saying that would you give somebody to for meal um, right before they get to work in the morning and they're driving themselves or whatever, then you're going to say, no, that's not safe or whatever. So the, those are the kind of things we might be asking. Um, so it can cause dizziness and, and it can even interfere with heart rhythms and it can, can interact with other drugs. So it's not as common. It's an old, old, old thing the press. They don't use it that much anymore. But, but it, can, it can help with the and um, sometimes it goes menopausal when you have atrophic vaginitis. Atrophy means what? We talked about that yesterday. Didn't we? Waste. Waste. Yeah, kind of waste away. So there, there's um, uh, some atrophic vaginitis. That means the vagina becomes, um, you know, sort of wasted away. That sounds awful. <laughs> 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 and that's what it is. That, that really is bad. And so, so um, women can have some relief with um, with topical <coughs> things, um, and or or other other methods of using you know, maybe like a vaginal suppository or something like that, to where they can get some some um, localized testing and not have it in their whole system to increase risk of breast cancer and all that. You do have to talk to the doctor about that, that whether whether your your risk is high enough that you shouldn't even have any systemic estrogen. Because some of it will go into the fully absorbing in the bloodstream. But most of it will stay stay right where you put it in the the top of your type. Um, but uh, gosh, I was trying to remember it was just this was a funny story, but one of my patients um, had we we were gonna give give her some estrogen cream for for something and I can't remember what it was, but but um, it was it was something that was supposed to be for the vaginal root that we just had a sample of, and um, and so so the the um, the test of the second one. Wow, I had I had um, we had had you know, I had to treat the vagina for a long time here, so we were here. It's like it's sick a long time. Just like I haven't even heard that word in a long time. 
<laughs> That's a twinkie. Using that can help with incontinence. It can help with prevention of urinary tract infection to some degree too. Because when you got vaginitis, then you got that irritation that could could result in in some infection and and um and affect the the uh, urinary tract as well since it's so close to the urethra. So the other ones for urge urge incontinence are. Um, the detrusor muscle, you know, that triple muscle that goes, goes up and down and sideways and, and all that, different, different kinds of, of muscle tissues layers on them. You don't have to remember the names on or anything, but just realize that there's, there's really some serious muscle infection going on every time you urinate. That's, that's a big deal. So, so the, with the vitropan and detrol, you can take it once or twice a day, and it, it doesn't affect you as much as like something like atrophy. I think atrophy is mentioned in some of your, your root um, readings. But, um, but but uh, anticholinergic drugs can cause like dry mouth and and um, sometimes even even dehydration. But it, it also can can cause some increased pressure in the eye when people have glaucoma. Um, that means the, the pressure is building up. Um, there's a uh, there's supposed to be a little little valve in the iris that kind of lets lets keeps things balanced in, in, as far as the fluid pressure in your eye. And, and uh, if there's some interruption in that that flow, it's going to build up. And these kind of drugs can encourage that. So check it's careful if they already have glaucoma. Check it where I'll go before you give that to me. And then um, urinary retention can be a side effect. Well, I, if you're curing the incontinence and then you're, you're causing retention, what's up with that? You know, that may not be so great. So, so look on page 1317 that because um, the uh, ditropan is the sort of your prototype drug. So that's what I really want you to know that one up one side and down the other because that's it's in your book and it's in your PowerPoint and it's this one that's very very commonly used. So anyway, um, we can have have uh, surgery for <coughs> cystocele or urethral. Yeah, that means like the bladder is is kind of the vagina or And then uh, the tacking of the bladder is, is the suspension, suspension of the bladder neck, and especially if you've got the got it dropping through where it's not supposed to be. So anyway, um, you can do some biofeedback and relaxation techniques. <coughs> that's kind of our key on that stuff. Um, we want to avoid diapers because uh, on adults, because that's for one thing speaking, and it also um, kind of gives them permission that, oh, if I'm wearing a diaper, then I can just, if everybody's just saying it's okay that I wet, so just don't, don't worry about it. I don't have to even try or don't have to try some therapy for it or whatever. So, so we can use briefs that are worn by underwear, of course, to, for protection, but it does, it does have a psychological connection there. Um, for, for just self-esteem and for, um, you know, whether you want to have motivation to, to learn to do some exercises and such. So anyway, the psychosocial effects are, are you know, increased caregiver stress, of course, because you have lots of sheets and change people if they're not able to do it themselves, that's really tough. And then um, there, there's, that's, what, that's like the main reason that people put, put their family members in the nursing home, especially if the like there's an elderly couple or something in there and one can't really do all that that turning and changing and, and laundering and <coughs> then that that's the reason why the person another person has to go to to a long-term care facility so that's the number one reason and then of course there's a risk for depression and social isolation because it well, if people smell for one thing if they think they smell bad then they're not going to want to go out and be with other people so that's a big deal um, as well. And there can be at risk for falls, especially if you've got that um, um, overflow. You've got to go and, um, and do you know, PT rinses every time and they just go six times an hour or whatever. That's every time you get up, um, if you have any um, mobility problems, then that's, that can be a, a risk for falls for sure. And then um, if, if they're light in urine and they're not being cared for properly, then the pressure ulcers are a risk, and then urinary tract infections, of course, as well. So um, now this this client teaching on this this particular notes page, um, this is really 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 important. So so you do need to know this: um, the fluid intake of at least um, 
one and a half to two liters a day, and now we always call two to three liters a day. I mean, it's a minimum. Um, and like you said, that if, if somebody is living alone and they can't get to the bathroom um, real easily and they, they have some of that functional incompetence and everything, they're not going to want to drink, are they? And that, that's really a problem. And so that messes with your bowels and your, and your um, renal function and bladder and everything. Uh, so, so we're in big trouble if they're dehydrated. And again, they know that they, they could easily fall if nobody's with them. So it, it's, it's really kind of a catch-22 sometimes. Um, but you, you want to drink, have them to drink plenty when they do have somebody around, if they if it's at all possible. But then decrease the the intake in the evening so that they don't have to get up at night because it is more dangerous than the night time for older people. I can tell now that my eyes have changed as far as um, I used to could cut off the light in one room and then just walk through the house in the dark. But I, my eyes don't adjust to the dark as quickly as they used to. I'm probably been slapping a little while the other day. <laughs> my husband had taken one of the night lights away because it, it would never go off. It, it you know, had a sensor on it, but it would never go off because it never was real, real bright in, in our hallway. And so he just took it out. And, and um, like I, just, I couldn't see, and I started walking, and I just slammed right into the our, uh, louver doors. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, I go in the black eye. But it was a little bit bruised, but not too bad. But, uh, but, to, but you know. I'm 57 and I haven't really had problems with that, but I can really tell that there's a difference in, you know, the reaction time to different people. So, okay, and, and we want to have the women's who are really douches and vaginal studies because those are the irritants. Um, that could cause more problems in the more. Okay, here's my favorite thing. You don't have to go Health and muscle exercises. Simple to me. You can do exercises. There's several places in here. Your, your book it's on 1321, 1322. So um, you have to help them. Some some patients to localize, like to to find the muscles that they use to like stop urination, to start and stop. You know, how do you release the urine? What do you do? And then how do you stop it? And it's really the holding, like you're going to stop your urinary flow. And, and then once they learn how to, to do that, then they can um, tighten and like, tighten the muscle and, and hold for 10 and relax for 10. You that's what you build up to. You start with just a few seconds of holding and releasing for 10 times and do it multiple times a day. And you can do it, you can do it anytime, anywhere. Related, so I, I did Kegel Swiss all the time, and um, it was my, my baby wasn't due for like nine more days or something like that. And I figured it was my first baby, so I'd be late instead of early. You know, we didn't even have the nursery all finished yet. But um, anyway, I went, went to bed like at 11 o'clock. <coughs> my water might break and I'm thinking, oh yeah, right. Well I'm doing these cables in my water. It's <laughs> 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 eleven o'clock at night and so you know ended up having to go to the hospital and all that. But but um, it was really because in, in October, well it, it through hurricane season and everything, if you're if you got any low barometric pressure, mm -hmm. um, that's what my that's what Dr. Painter told me that the low barometric pressure associated with like hurricanes and storms and stuff sometimes can he calls it the membranes to break and to run through. That happened with my mom. This is my birthday, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I cooked 27, and mm -hmm. Sarah I cooked 28. So, um, but that's just a, that's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. but, but anyway, I, I have had a problem with leaves since I had all any of my babies, though. So I, I really, I don't know if that's the reason or if I'm just lucky that I'm going to take a chance I'm <coughs> doing those things, I tell you. And let me see if I can find my little secret thing. Okay. Okay, Tyler. Is Tyler here? Yeah, Tyler's yeah. back there. Are you still working that same nursing home? Like that story you told me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. You might have something to do that. Uh, 
doctors and who get the word from the newspaper magazine. Duquesne exercises may help prevent and treat urinary incontinence. To do while lying down, squeeze pelvic muscles, one used to stop urine midstream. For a count of three seconds, then relax for three. Work up to three sets of ten. When muscles get stronger, exercise while sitting or standing. Okay, this this is it. Listen to me. Kegels help you reach better orgasm. Wow. reason to, no, to be an advocate for Kegels. <laughs> and, and if you tell your patient that, maybe they'll just begin to get you doing it. All right, young buddy. You want to have good orgasm? Go ahead and take your Kegels. What? No visitors? No. Well. <laughs> So don't don't discount that uh, older people are interested in this. So. Okay. <laughs> but um, if you really really can indulge that, that's one of the things that people can do to do reverse and contrast on, or at least improve it. Think of the kids. It's for people that have some valid problems. Anybody go to the penning for, uh, some of y'all may have known some of the students, I don't know, but anyway, um, our, our president of the SMA or the president of this class, Robert Ledford, was doing a talk and just kind of, you know, reliving memories of, and saying there's certain things about certain teachers, and he didn't really say anything about me at the beginning, and so, you know, he just picked out a few things. And, well, then at the very end of the speech, he's like, um, okay, um, one, of our, one of our teachers was really interested in it. So all these people that work at my church are not all that too. He really singled me out on that one. So, so anyway, I wish he could hear that. I need to send him a copy. All right, so um, what we need to do too is decrease, it, or at least recommend decrease if somebody has incontinence problems, increase caffeine use and um, lay off the Mountain Dew and the, the coffee if you can. And if you can do the, you know, the caffeine free, that's <coughs> But then again, citrusy things. So you can say, so I'll probably all in the I do my problems. I'm flying my people in the head, so I Okay, anyway, um, so uh, artificial sweeteners that have the NutraSweet aspartame in it can, can irritate some people's bladders, and then alcohol can irritate bladders too, and anything that, that tends to irritate the bladder is going to be those are some, that's really something to remember. I want you to remember that part too. Cables and the, what you shouldn't be drinking. Uh, okay, so um, there are some other behavioral things that you can do. I think in one of the other um, slides it says something about that people with cognitive problems can do maybe habit training where you actually um, actually take them, if it's, or no, excuse me, schedule toilet. The schedule toilet, where you do it at a certain interval, and, and you take them to the bathroom before they've they've actually gone incontinently because of the functional incontinence, because they don't know that they've got to do that, but um, yeah, but their bladder's working well and all that. Just if you take them to the bathroom at certain scheduled intervals, then then that can can help, and other people can benefit from that as well. 
And then habit training is then, if somebody has become incontinent, find out how often they usually go for, you know, what, what times of day they usually go. How much did you bring for the breakfast, like supper, and, you know, try to mimic those patterns that, for the habit training to do it according to, to what they were used to. And then bladder training is when they help increase the capacity, like when people are going to get small amounts of, um, uh, more often, then what you want to do is to to have them to go to the bathroom like every every hour or every two hours, and then gradually increase. and And when they do have to go, if they're trying, if they're increasing the interval and they're having a the urge to go, um, this would be for urging comments or the uh, I guess the overflow sometimes as, as well. But um, they're not going to have overflow if they're going that often. Though, so. But, but anyway, um, they need to resist the urge to boil. Then you can teach them to take the grass into the pool. My foot is on something else until it's time for the intervals to get up on the increase in the two hours to three hours to the day. And um, if they can get up to 300 mLs per boy, then, then you um, pretty much succeed and then they can, can maintain that. Okay, and then there's a practice guideline box, pages 1320 to 1321, and also on 1319. There's a lot of repetition in here, but it's because some of it's about home care and some of it's about hospital care, or some of it may be like if you're in a doctor's office and just seeing somebody for their yearly physical that you, you could teach. teach them, so. um, okay, and then um, sometimes if they're um, in men, in particular, we need to have a prostate exam on a regular basis to see if they're to your doctor. And women need to have a study exam to see if there's any structural problems or infections or anything like that. And then um, it is a, a discussion that some uh, women may want to have with their, their gynecologist or, or primary care about um, risks and benefits of hormone replacement therapy. Uh, because there are there are risks to it, and it, it may be worth it to some some women. So that is something to discuss with the doctor, um, and then uh, whatever it, like physical therapy to to regain um, some uh, mobility um, in particular, and then, then maybe some occupational therapy as well, so that that um, the patient can function better overall, and then including the uh, urinary tract. Um, and then if there's an, if surgery is an option, then that would be something that the patient's choice, and then. Um, there's any you know, change in your radar and any symptoms to like a therapy by the way. Okay. And okay, so for urinary retention, um, it's, it can stretch the walls and all this and, and cause some, some damage and people really end up having incontinence after they get the retention solved if that's possible. So so that's that's a that can be a big issue. Sometimes um, with the retention if it continues to collect in the bladder you can't release it. You just get like the sweats and all that's and it's it's really, really uncomfortable and scary. So anyway the the, the detrusor muscle muscle contractility is um, not good and, and um, small amount voided with no relief and all that. Um, and so you want to maybe do a bladder scan if you suspect it what's a what's a physical that you can do. What do you call palpation? Okay. 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 Palpation okay. bladder. Or what? What are you going to feel over the bladder if you're going to palpation? You're going to feel the distension. Yeah, yeah. And what about, what's another method that you can tell if there's a lot of liquid in there? What do you do to water the elements? Squeeze it. Yeah, <laughs> well, you're not going to pump it. Like that, what would you do? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's like a lot of water now, and you know there's, there's something there that we shouldn't have. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, I think we really need to discuss some of the things that we talk about. I think that was on your own, some of the aspects. But if there is a, a stricture to the ureter or a stricture in, in the urethra or um, uh, any kind of mechanical obstruction from a stone or a tumor or anything, that can cause it retention. So it may not be just a you know, muscle issue. It may be something else um, pathologically wrong, so you certainly need to, to search for, for um, any of those kinds of causes. But the pelvic trauma and then that certainly is something that, that some people may not ever, ever get over and they have to do the um, catheterization. So but you may see this um, on x-rays or with your patient's um, history, hydronephrosis or hydronephrosis. You see hydronephrosis more often. You know what that would be? So when we, we said chyle means kidney, but what does kidney pH mean? Kidney. It's also talking about kidney. And, and so when you talk about uh, 
people. Hydronephrosis. Excessive water. Yeah, yeah, and that's if you're if you're not releasing your your urine from your bladder, mm -hmm. um, it's going to have so much pressure that it mimics those those um, valves. And in those in those anatomy pictures, look at the, those um, pictures of the bladder. Or some of these slides. I have it twice, and so that is really to well demonstrate this. But anyway, if if you let the, if the, the valves get messed up, the valve action of the muscles um, gets, gets messed up and, and it kind of blows because of the, the pressure. It can go up the ureter and that can be hydroureter, but then it goes up to the kidney and swells the kidney up and that can cause renal failure. So do remember that, that the worst case scenario with urinary retention is renal failure. So, um, and there, that's another kidney word. I don't know why I have so many kidney words, but NIF and renal and and pile, and all of those are have to be hidden. So we're going to always trying to confuse us. The one the bladder has 250 to 450 or whatever, and then, you know that, that interval that I'm not going to make you memorize that. Just know a ballpark because all these different places are, have a little bit different um, uh, documentation of what when you should go to the bathroom. The 250 to 450 is what this, this particular page says. I think different people write different pages in these textbooks and they take it a little bit different and everybody's like, I'm confused. And so I'm not going to make you say exactly what the number range is. Just have a ballpark um, in your head. That's, it. That's okay. That's fine. And, um, but, but anyway, a lot of times nurses are the world's worst at, at um, ha well, having urinary tract infections because we only go to the bathroom when we get the first signal to go. That's really one of the safety vents of, of, of having um, or preventing urinary tract infections because when you go to the bathroom, and it, it's actually a mechanical flush of um, if any germs have gone up, up there from the, from the um, ankle area, then, then the, if you've got that, that flush of the, um, of the urine, you've got an adequate urine flow, then, then that's going to keep that from falling up to your kidneys and cause a really bad infection, which could also cause renal failure um, in worst case scenario. So, um, anyway. Um, if we have a detrusor muscle problem, they might have surgery, and then we've got we've got other drugs, the anticholinergics, the atropine, and the anti-anxiety uh, drugs, antidepressants, <coughs> you know, histamines, and congestants, and all, all those kind of things can actually um, actually cause cause the problem. This is not a treatment. This is a this is a cause. But if you have you have um, surgery on your bladder, and a lot of times women who just had a baby. Because everything's been so stretched and the cruiser muscles didn't really recognize when the bladder's full. So a lot of times people will have to have it in and out path a couple of times until their bladder sort of first settles down into recognizing when, when the bladder's full. And then the voluntary is when you just don't go and you need you need to go, you know you need to go, or there's not a bathroom and you don't want to go in the woods or, or whatever. But um, but and some people are embarrassed to go in public. They won't go in a public bathroom because they think somebody will hear them, and if somebody hears them, that'll be just the most embarrassing thing in the world. But that's really a phobia that a lot of people have, so that can be a risk factor too. Um, and then um, accidents and infections are really talked about that as far as we So, okay, all of the vesicodurerum, that's, that's my picture. So, when the bladder is relaxed and, and the urine's coming from, from the kidney down the ureter, then we've got this little opening here. Um, and so it, that's, it, the, the urine's swollen that way. But when you, when you actually, when the detrusor muscle contracts when you're avoiding, this, the muscle actually is, is the, the valve that closes. And, and then, then it's not going to go up here. The, the pressure is not going to send it up, up here because the muscle is, is at this particular junction and it's closed. <coughs> now, if you've had a lot of retention, though, and it's weakened those muscles, then, then that's where you're in trouble with it, with it going, going up the other way and going to your urine or kidney and, and causing um, um, pressure there and, and ultimately infection the rest of the time. Okay, so. Um, the, when we have urinary retention, we've already really talked about that. And we have 25 to 50 ml of frequent intervals as the overflow requirements, and the difficulty starting the urinary stream. Um, overflow breathing, that's the same thing as a leak of 25 to 50 or a leak that. That's just that frequent. Mm -hmm. And then we just send it there. We've already said that too. 
Um, and so we've already talked about too about the bladder scan and the catheterization in order to, to tell um, how much is, is left in the residual. We don't want it to be over 100 ml. Okay, I'll let y'all look at all. These are the ones that were in. Uh, I put total, but, but um, I don't think that's in in your book. But it it, it was in our old book, and I think. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I'm not. I don't want to be getting in trouble saying I'm not that that wild about men. I think men have done a good job finding some things that are important. And sometimes, sometimes what what men have is not exactly what your patient has. You know, like normal out. You don't have to do a concept that once. But sometimes, it's not exactly what it's for. So if you've got me for clinical, just, just ask me. You know, like what what can we call it? You know, Deanna asked me about what the devil men on did. About that, there was something that just didn't quite. I can't even remember what it was, but, but um, sometimes if you could just tell what the problem is, you know, like the wording of a, of a man to diagnose. Some, sometimes you just have to do that. But talk, talk to your instructor if, if um, there's an issue that, like, they update a man and they got rid of something that you thought you could use or whatever. Say, can I, can I use this because it really fits, you know? So, so I, I, would, I would ask your instructors to so don't get in trouble. But, but then there's related um, nursing diagnoses like infection. And, Scores and all that sort of thing, they're, they're collateral diagnoses. Okay, these are the, um, like kind of umbrella um, diagnoses, and then we can do the, the, um, the very specific um, as evidenced by kind of things in, in just little baby steps. That's what we want you to do in clinical because you're not you don't need to, you're not going to be able to do this in two days of clinical, but you can say, you know, a patient will be able to hold, um, hold urine for two hours before you know, incontinence or something like that if they're, if they're in a um, bladder training program or something like that. So, so anyway, these are, these are sort of um, those sort of general umbrella diagnoses. But then um, I like it, what, the one that I put on the, um, the notes page, goals and outcomes, so they need to be specific and measurable. Um, the client will avoid within eight hours of catheter removal. Urinary output is greater than 30 cc an hour. I mean, that's very, very specific and it's very, very realistic within your time of of um, being at the hospital. They still may not need it, but you want it to be, you don't want to have to say that you're expecting that to happen in two days of care. So write, write something that like the outcome that you will see in your ads up and spine. That's what the goal is the umbrella and then the, the as it is is the what outcome do you want to see like over the next two days? Because that's your timely part when you go by when, really you know, your last day in clinical. So anyway, um Oh, don't use incontinent draw sheets that are the impermeable or waterproof, like those, those chucks pads that they, they have. And that, those are good for some situations, but um, not not necessarily for lying the patient on. You might want to use them like when you're starting an IV or something and you don't want to mess up the pillow or whatever. That's not, that, it's not good, though, um, because they really did um, expose the patient to a lot of, a lot of wetness and, and um, the skin breakdown. Right but those, those new ones that hold like 300 pounds and they for diapers. Actually, um, bring to the lower level of the, um, <coughs> the, the, the top of the um, dry. So, so anyway, that's very protective. And um, and again, we've got about the, the cables. And you can talk, you can teach people like an elevator too. You can you can just contract the muscle a little bit and then, then a little more and then even a little more and that, that strengthens your your um, your muscles even even, even greater. So it depends on who you're talking to as to what the what the technique is, but the elevator is just a good um, um, analogy as far as um, trying to teach people. Okay, I always have to we're supposed to give you a little bit of cam stuff. You don't have a whole lot. Now I um I know that 08 is not is less than, I mean it's more than five years ago, but I, I um, subscribed to Dr. Andrew Wiles' um, newsletter, online newsletter now, and this was from from the, the one that used to be just published as a as a paper copy. They just has it all online now, but this is about cranberry um, that it, it does alter the cell membranes of the bacteria. It doesn't appear to the brain tissue. And, hmm. and, uh, So what do you if you recommend it kind of juice it needs to be unsweetened though because that the unsweetened works a whole lot better. Um, and then or four hundred milligrams of cranberry extract if you take like a capsule. 
manicuring or putting it forward, that's one of the things. These are all things that he said. And it's like, wow. I said, have y'all ever heard of him? He's like, you know, Jerry, you know, this is not going to do it. He started integrating medicine as a specialty at the University of Arizona at Tucson. And he was like, he's like, this is six months and all that. He's still, he's a, actually, he actually majored in botany and knew a whole lot about plants. And so he's really perfect for integrating medicine. He is a medical doctor, too. So he's a Anyway, it tells you the um, the beans, eggs, whole grains, breads, cranberries, prunes, all lower the pH and, and decrease the uh, bacteria in the bladder. And then I've got that update from from, uh, from 2010. Um, and that there is a little bit, uh, and it's really the same same kind of stuff. So so it is updated from from 08 to 10. That, that's within five years, so I can tell you that. But um, he is somebody asked him a question about that. There's been some kind of study where they showed the people that they use cranberries, cranberry juice, or cranberry capsules. I can't remember which method it was, which weird it was, but, but they um, they didn't. They had they had more infections than a control group. But, but Dr. Wild looked at that study and he said that there were there were possibly some other factors that that um, affected that. So so he said I'm not so sure if it's just that one study you need to see see more. But they. In, in the lab, they can tell, though, that, that cranberries do actually acidify and, and do um, change the, the cell wall so it doesn't, um, so the bacteria doesn't stick to the, to the urinary tract. All right, so a lot of this is very repetitious, I know, but position is a real big deal. We talked about position, privacy, um, and I don't know if any of y'all, maybe y'all aren't, y'all didn't go to, to slumber parties where you were mean to people like, like I did sometimes. But um, what, what we would do um, sometimes is to, if somebody would go to sleep during a slumber party, you know, everybody's kind of challenging each other to stay awake all night. And if somebody goes to sleep, then you put their hand in the warm water so they'll wet, they'll wet their sleeping bag. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I never saw it work, but we tried it a few times. But it, it really, it really can work though. And, yeah, running the water can can make. Have you ever heard of? You really had to go to the bathroom really bad, and you're on your trip, and there's no place to stop to go to the bathroom. And then there's this Coca Cola ad or something where they're pouring the Coke into into the cup, and you're like, oh no, quit it, quit it, quit it, turn the radio off, and, or you're or you're hiking or something, and you and you go by a, a babbling brook or a waterfall or something. It's like, oh my gosh. That happened to me when I was in Washington. We were on the like, oh gosh, I can't get away from this water. Anyway, we did end up going in the woods a lot there, though. So it was there's nobody around. So. But and warm sits baths can can help because because um the warm water over the over the perineum or the warm sits bath um, really can can stimulate the desire and the relaxation too that you need to, to make. So um in as far as with retention, when you do the catheterization for retention, um, there, there's a lot of variability on this, whether this is a little rule or not, but, but this vagovasal vago response um, sometimes can happen when, when you take a lot of urine out, 500 to 700 urine out at one time. Some people will have a, a weak spell, their blood pressure will drop a they will have a sweat. And just like if you have a sweat when you have the retention in the first place, you can when they take, take it off, it's just, sometimes people will, I know when I had, had Sarah, I had, I had this shake, I was just, I was just trembling all over, I wasn't cold, it was just this trembling all over, it was really scary, but I think, I think it was the, the change in the abdominal pressure is what, what makes that happen, and, and it, it causes, I guess that's what's going on here with the tension as well, um, but that's a vagovasal, vasovagal, so anyway, if, if they, they start having symptoms, or if your policy is that if you've got you know, 500 to 700 already out, that you clamp it for, for five to 10 minutes and then give resentment, that's something that you, you need to be aware of if you're doing it in an out cap, and, um, whether your, your facility that you're working at or where your clinical um, requires you to clamp it um, and once you get to a certain volume. Okay, and again, I, I was saying there that you can, you can um, do the... The, uh, teach people that it's not normal to be incontinent. That's not normally associated with, with aging. Maybe associated with it for higher risk, but it's not just a, a normal consequence. It is abnormal to have incontinence or retention. Um, and a lot of this is um, stuff we've already said. The other thing is um, double avoiding. 
um, if if, um, if the patient can just stay on the toilet for, for you know, if they can sit for a while, or if it's a lady especially, or if it's a man, if they can go in the urine or you know, like two to five minutes after they went the first time. But, but um, another thing that you can do is just have them to, to go, go and stop and then, then um, like sort of change positions a little bit and then go again because we're not, since our bladder has those or how do you say that word with the, the little the stretching areas and everything? There may be sort of a pocket of urine somewhere else. And if you if you just um, you know go a little bit, I mean go and stop to where you feel like you're you are leave, but then you're like, okay, let, let me just make sure I'm not gonna get to get another get to another bathroom for hours or whatever, then you can maybe change positions a little bit and then, then go some more and, and that. I, mean, I, I do that sometimes because it's like I, I want to get it want to get it all out and you know they've got those folds there's folds in there and you may not feel um, that you, you've got that pressure but if you get as much out as possible that can help and that that's a that can help um, people with potential too. Okay. Um, and then um, that there is a confusion loss. I think I've heard this several times. It's got a lot of stuff in it. It's on this 19 and then charts um, and boxes in your chapter. Okay, so we can know what happened. Let me just put a plug in. On November 14th, um, that's a, a lab day, and we're going to be. We're either going to be in room 115 or up here. I need. I have reserved 115 because the PN class wanted to come, but they weren't sure now because they got a little bit behind. But they're not sure if they're going to be able to, to join with us. So if they're not joining with us, we'll be in here. But if they, I'm going to check with them um, today probably to see if that if they're still planning to do that. But Amanda Griffin is a um, wound osteo <coughs> incontinence care nurse. She's certified in. in for those types of patients. She used to do this at Rowan, and now she's doing it at the VA. She has come every year since I've been teaching this unit, and you know, when Ms. McNeely was teaching it too, um, to, to help us get, we actually do check-offs on, on ostomy in this lab with her. She, she um, teaches us about um, pressure ulcer care and wound, other wounds, and then um, ostomy care. So that, that's um, urinary ostomy as well as um, is the <coughs> ostomies. So anyway, this, this one will just sort of be a quick run through. A lot of it's just just pictures, but um, and these are a lot of this is in your um, in your book. But the um, a urinary diversion is when you have a stoma. What's a stoma? It's an opening. Yeah. The mouth is the really thing. So you have And it diverts the flow of the urine from the kidneys directly to the abdominal surface. It can be temporary or permanent. They may be able to, to rehook if they if the area heals. But if it's from tumors or something like that, they may not be able to, to get it to heal. This this is really not not a rocket science thing. It really is pretty much all in your book. But I just wanted to emphasize a few things here. And then you, you can have a ureterostomy where the um, where the ureters or both of the ureters um, is, is uh, to the um, the surface to bring, bring it to the skin surface. There are some some um, continent urinary diversions that are the post couch and the bladder, and then the incontinent is the ureterostomy because we don't have any vessels or sphincters to control that. Um, the nephrostomy, <coughs> the testicostomy, you just have an opening into your, your bladder. The EDS size, you know, that's a that's, um, that's a, uh, a word or a prefix for bladder is the vesico. Nephro, of course, we know is, is, the, is kidney and uh, ureter. Ureteral is something uh, ureter. And then there's an ileal conduit that's, that's incontinent as well. And um, <coughs> these pictures show you the, the um, nephrostomy is that they actually have this little like J tube in, inside to, to sort of coil to keep it in place so it doesn't just slide right out. But you can see that in, in the, the picture. And then and there's a, there's an ureter in, in the bladder and all, but, but there's there's flow to the outside in a, in a pouch. There would still be some, some flow um, through the, the kidney possibly, I mean, through the bladder and everything. But, but um, this from that, that uh, kidney is going to go into this, this collection bag. I think I'm going to um, pass around these things um, maybe 
maybe Monday or during the lab. Well, we've got, I don't know, we may not have enough time for all that, but, but um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I may just do that, that on Monday after you've seen some of these things. But, but that's just, you hate to see somebody have to go through this. Okay, this is a suprapubic catheter. How many people have worked with suprapubics before? There's pretty many people, some people have that as a really long-term solution instead of having a Foley catheter in the urethra. It's, it's really um, sometimes safer for the patient as far as infection and all to to, and, and trauma to the to the urinary tract too. The, the, the urethra can be really traumatized for, for long term foley. So so here's another sort of J um, kind of device that, that keeps it in, in place. But then this is actually it goes through the skin and, and then into the bladder and that that's what holds it and then, then the, the catheter drains just like a like a foley would. But um, you do have to have to definitely um, take care of the super pubic. And they do do it surgically, of course, um, through the abdominal wall above the symphysis pubis into the bladder. So that's that's really right where that is. And then the maintenance is, is the uh, the same as, as you, you would do sterile technique for, for any new cap at the at the insertion site. If you're changing the catheter, you would you would do sterile technique just like you would for when it's saying same, it's saying same as the Foley catheter. I know you haven't had that yet, but we'll go over that just briefly in a minute, and then we're going to do it in detail. This is coming Thursday. Yeah, when we that, there's we're having the lab then, but then the, the 14th is, is when um, Amanda is coming in. That it since that is your check off on on the ostomies, then it, everybody please be here because <laughs> it, it's really, you know, we we can substitute and check you off later, but it's nothing like having the experience of hearing hearing what um, Amanda has to say. She's just some of y'all have heard her before, haven't you? Y'all don't you think it's very worthwhile to have have Amanda's expertise and she, you know, if you have questions about certain things or situations that you've seen before and you're like, what did, what does this mean or why are they doing this and what is there another product that might work better and all that kind of stuff. She just she knows all of that. She's wonderful. Okay, and this is this is that that uh, Coke pouch and and um, and so it, it is the new bladder is joined to the to the urethra and then uh, the urethra carries the urine from the new bladder um, down to the to the penis. So that it that actually is is a, a con continent. And then that's in your book explaining a little bit about how they do the procedure too. Okay, and and um, this is just another another view of it. They've just made a they made a new a new bladder um, for that they can be um, capitalized. <coughs> and then this one is is the ileal conduit. They actually cut cut a piece of bowel. It looks like a sausage. <laughs> they do. They just cut a piece of bowel. And and then they they um they tie it up. Of course, the, they can tie it up at both ends. And then then the um, the urine goes. It has a stoma to the outside though, and you catheterize that stoma to get the, the urine out. And so so that's um, um that's called that's in, incontinence. So, um, all right. And then they, these are like Foley Foley catheters and. These are just different that it has a little hole at the end. That's where the urine comes out. One of the things that, that we have um, some controversy over is this balloon thing. I'll talk to you in a minute. But intermittent catheters are straight, and sometimes they're a little more rigid than the, the ones that you that you keep in for a longer time. They're really a little easier to get in to some degree too. But they, these are the, the intermittent kind. They're just a single single use. Now, sometimes people that um, that are that have that are the people with MS that are catheterizing themselves multiple multiple times a day or, um, will will use a clean procedure and just wash it um, according to directions. Because one of, one of your books, I can't even remember which source that it say. I think it is the fundamentals book. And some at some point says that you need to teach them that, how to clean the, the catheters. But um, they have these advertisements on TV about getting new catheters every time and that your insurance should pay for it, blah, 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 and all that. So, so it's, it, the idea would be that you use a new one every time. But maybe that's not always what happens in practice. But, but 
But there's this, always a sterile procedure when we're doing it, you know, for somebody with urinary retention or whatever. And then when we are doing it, we're, we're doing it sterile. But anyway, the, this one is the, the one that is indwelling. It stays in place longer than this one. This is just, this is called in and out catheter. And then, then that, this is the, the indwelling. And the balloon helps to hold it into the bladder, of course. And what, uh, one of the procedures that we usually teach y'all is to inflate the balloon before you put it in the patient just to make sure that it's competent. There are some catheters though that that when you do inflate the BARD company, B-A-R-D, if, if you use that in, in the facility where you work, they don't recommend that you inflate the balloon ahead of time. If some of y'all run into that, that you, you're not supposed to inflate it beforehand. So well, I'm gonna have to see what, what brand that y'all have. I don't think y'all's is BARD. We might have you to do that just in practice about you know blowing up the balloon ahead of time just so you'll you'll know how to do it but in the, the checkoff i understand that when the pn group did their checkoffs that they did not inflate it will have you to practice with one of your catheter kits um and and then and you can just you know keep packaging it back and getting some new sterile gloves or, or even pretending like they're sterile <laughs> again you know just use the gloves again uh, when practice with this save save a new one for your checkoff because it will be a lot easier to get get a catheter in that's not then that the balloon hasn't already been inflated it does make a difference it's not as smooth going in so so um i think most of the most, uh, places are going to go to the, the procedure where you do not um inflate the balloon. You'll just have to see what it's supposed to be in, in the facility where you're in clinical or where you're working. Okay. And um, you can look at what the intermittent and, and dwelling catheters are, are for and in which situations. So I think it's pretty, um, that would be pretty, <clears throat> pretty obvious. Okay. And then the, the catheter insertion, I'm just going to do this really, really quick because, um, Okay, I guess that's right. I thought I had it out of order. We have, you have to have a doctor's order to do uh, in and out cath or an indwelling cath. It's got to be sterile when we're doing it as, as um, nurses and all that. Um, we have to organize our equipment. That's really key. And that's what, there's lots of right ways to do it. And then we'll probably see some of you guys that are, that are that are all CNAs that have done catheterizations, right? Some of y'all are really expert at doing that. So, so um, you probably have your own method and you're, you're going to do it just fine. And um, we, we can tell you, give you some suggestions and everything. The whole thing is that you got to make sure you just keep sterile what needs to be sterile. And you've got to know when, when you've broken sterile technique and when to, when to start over. I mean, that, that's the, the main thing that, that we will be watching you for is to wh whether you are maintaining sterility. Um, with the, your catheter in your hand that, that's putting the catheter in and, until you've got the balloon blown up and, and everything is, is all, all done. So um, anyway, we want to maintain a closed drainage system. We don't want to be opening up um, like between the tube coming out of the bladder and the, the drainage system, if at all possible. Sometimes you have to, but if the doctor orders it that particular way. But, but maintaining a closed drainage system does decrease infections. and. Um, Let's see, the, the, the bags hold 1,000 to 1,500 cc's, which you do, do need if it starts to get, get full. If somebody's taking a lot of Lasix or another diuretic, or if they're just having a diuresis, like if they got a catheter after a C-section and they're having that, that postpartum diuresis, you may need to um, empty it pretty often so that it doesn't, doesn't leak or um, doesn't put um, stress on the... The, the catheter itself. And we, we need to um, make sure that we never hang the bag on the side rail or on the floor and we never put it um, above the, the bladder. We want, it always needs to be below the bladder and we, we want to make sure we don't have kinks in the tubing. Um, they hang on the bed frame, don't hang on the side rails. If you, if you hang it on the side rail that's down and then somebody yanks that side rail up, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Or what might happen? That's this. Yank that thing out, and there's, that can really damage the urethra. So anyway, and if the patient's walking, you need to carry the bag below their waist so that the, the gravity's may be a main, maintaining it going in, out of the patient and not going back in. Because we don't want to get like hydrourethra because we're holding the, the bag above the bladder, and then it, it's going back up, and it, it might, might um, cause the hydrourethra or um, 
um, hydronephrosis or, or whatever, or especially infection. You hope that everything in there is sterile, but, but the longer it sits, the more likely that the bacteria could have gotten in if somebody you know, has, has um, released the urine from it and measured it and everything and then maybe contaminated the tip. We, we just don't want it to go backwards in the system. It needs to go, go down with gravity. So, and I'm just going to go real quickly through this, um, this procedure. Right there. I think it's tired. <laughs> what? I think it's tired. <laughs> well, this, these are these pictures you can look up quite um, easier probably on your own computer, but, but this is just showing all the of where where the urinary meatus is. It's be, between the the um, the clitoris. It's, it's in, it, you have to open up the labia majora and the labia minora. But there's the majora on the outside, the minora is where toward the inside. And um, there's the vagina, and there's the urethral meatus, and there's the clitoris. So that's that's what we're, we're looking for. We, we put the, the female in a dorsal or combing position. That means they're on the back with their, their knees bent. Um, and a male is, is on their back with their, their thighs abducted somewhat. Not, not way out, but just a, you know, sort of a relaxed position. We have to drape the patient, clean the perineal area, open the catheter kit, apply the gloves, organize the supplies, and test the balloon, maybe. We'll see how that works out in our facilities. Okay, and this is a way that we can get, um, let's see, this, this is the, the um, actually testing the balloon, where, where you actually put the, the saline that comes in the gun, um into the, the part of the tube. It's like a double lumen tube. One has the, the saline that you're putting in for the water that you're putting into the balloon, and the other well, is for the drainage to connect to the drainage bag. So that's just the procedure for that. And then, then this is the, the cleaning part. Um, place the sterile tray on the sterile drape, cleanse the urethral meatus. Well, there's so many different ways to do that. We'll show you some videos about it too. And, um, and then, then you, um, you insert the, the catheter in the female. Um, you insert it just for about two to three inches. That's, it's not long at all. And, and you do, when you start to get urine, then you, you would just insert it um, a, a little bit further, just an inch or so further. Um, and before you inflate your, your balloon. So, um, and this, this will just give you an idea. You do definitely have to keep the labia spread the entire time. If you let it go go back, you have to start over with the cleaning process and everything. If you contaminate your catheter, you have to get another catheter. Um, if you miss and it goes into the vagina, it's a good idea to leave it in the vagina because that way you're not going to stick it there again. So then you get you a new catheter and then you can have that perspective that you know you need to go a little bit higher. It's not always this easy to, to visualize. Some of y'all have done done catheters, you know it's not always that, that readily visible, right? It's, it's um, this is really showing it in, in the comfortable <coughs> situation. So and then the, with the with the male um, the, you have to um, to to cleanse um, three times with, with the iodine solution, um, starting with the meatus and go go to the uh, a little bit down down the shaft of the penis. And you do have to, to elevate the, the penis because it, it does it, it, it would make a kink if you if you have it at a another angle, then it, it's it's going to probably meet some resistance because of the, the way that the, the urethra um, sort of kinks. Um, when, when the penis is in another position. So, so you definitely have to have it at a perpendicular for, for most people. Um, okay, and then um, once we anchor the catheter to a male, we'll, we'll um, uh, do it on the low, lower abdomen or the top of the thigh. And uh, for a female, we'll, we'll uh, anchor to the middle. And I'm, not, I'm really skipping a whole bunch of steps, but anyway, this will, it's just sort of an intro. Okay, and this is um, this is where I have these big letters, and I've got a fix now, and I will, I will repost it if I didn't get the right one in there. If you some of y'all have to print it, you don't have to print that necessarily. This doesn't have a whole lot on it necessarily either. But, um, but then this is just a good way to hang your your, um, your catheter bag, and it's not it is on the bed frame. It's not on the, the side rails, and there's no there's nothing that's um, 
there's not a loop going down to, to make it like some, sometimes the, the catheters want to, to loop down here and then then go up and, and that does slow it from, from going into here. This is really the ideal way to do it. You're going to always see that that's happening, like the wall in or all that. You may not always be able to keep it in a position like that, but that's that's sort of the ideal. You want to maintain the gravity and drainage at all times and then no loops below the atrium. The so and make sure that the tube is not clogged, that it is patent, it is open and it's drained. And, um, and here we've got keep the drainage receptacle below the level of the client's bladder, ensure a closed drainage system and you're not taking, taking it loose. Observe the flow of urine every two to three hours, note the color odor and abnormal constituents and you want to, to chart that when you have a patient with a foley um, if, this, if there's sediment present. Presently, I'll check it more frequently and certainly report it if that's a new finding. <coughs> and then that, that's a, a device that uh, I think most um, facilities have devices to, to anchor down the, the catheters. But, but if not, you can, you can do it with really tape. Um, and while a patient has a catheter, make sure they get plenty of fluid intake and encourage acidic urine. The, the, some of the things with like the, the cranberries um, and uh, and but we, we don't want them to do the, the, the citrus necessarily. And I guess when you've got a catheter, it's not quite as big a deal, but if you've had problems with spasms and all that, then you may want to take away the citrus juices and use like the apple or cranberry. And perineal care, we use soap and water, um, and then we change the catheter and drainage system on when we have to, um, because um, any time that you open the system, that's, that's encouraging possible growth of bacteria. Um, we don't want to catheterize unless it's absolutely necessary. We want to get it out as soon as, as, as possible. And that they usually want to do that on the day after surgery when they put a folding in for surgery. Um, and we certainly want to keep, um, uh, follow good hand hygiene and encourage your patients to and prevent the fecal contamination if they have a stool getting cleaned up as, as soon as possible so that that can't go up, up the uh, tube. And the, this next one is just how to um, collect a urine sample from an um, indwelling catheter. There, there are, um, this one's showing going in with a needle, and I left that there because most of them are needle-free systems where you just take the take the syringe itself. It has to be a burlock <coughs> syringe, the kind that, that actually has the little little threads like a screw on it, and and, um, and then this would be a little bit different, and you could just hook it up that way, but you do have to clean it uh, first. It is a sterile procedure to, to um, get the, the um, the urine out, you don't want to put anything in there that's, that's not sterile and you, you don't want to introduce anything in um, by, by not cleaning it. You definitely have to clean the, the port and we'll show you that on the new kits. Unless they've changed, we still have the, the kind that, that has those ports where you have to put the needle in. And there's this, this is just some ways showing that those are, that's the right way to, to um, anchor it down and um, try to, to um, Remove as soon as possible. We already said that. There's some repetition in here too. And this is just a, if you are doing the open bladder irrigation, that that, um, that you may have to put some saline in to, to remove, you know, get some blood clots to, to come down or break up some blood clots. And so this this is where if you do have to open it up, you do have an order. This is the kind of kit that you use, and you, it is still a, a sterile procedure. Though you have to make sure that that, that syringe that you're putting in is is, uh, is sterile, and you're not introducing anything in. And then this is for um, continuous bladder irrigation, like if somebody has had a had prostate surgery, and they so they're going to have some blood in their urine for for a while, and they they put bladder they put fluid into the bladder. Um, and then, um, then it goes, it just sort of rinses it out and then just goes into the, the drainage bag. And when it starts to get real clear and, and mostly yellow or maybe just a little <coughs> pinkish yellow, um, then they, they'll, um, they'll remove that. Um, the, the, the catheter will stop doing, at least stop doing, maybe they'll leave the catheter in, but they'll stop doing the irrigation. It's a three-way catheter though, so you've got the, got the balloon and the, the drainage of the urine and then you've got um, the, the the port for the irrigation to go into. That's something that we will we'll talk about as far as um, how, how to do the math with that when you're doing, we'll, we'll talk about that um, later on with that, how, to, how to do your I and O with that. But that's part of the I and O on the CDD, so I want y'all to pay attention to that. And then I do, I do, I was going to pass around some condom catheters, but the condom catheter is an alternative to, to having a, a Foley and it's less likelihood of, an, uh, of infection and trauma. 
And of course, that some of these things are what we've already learned, blood retraining and all that, after you've had a, a catheter restorative care. So I'll let y'all just read over that. And then we you know, evaluate our effectiveness of interventions. One of the most important things, though, on this page is on the notes page, take showers, not tub baths, if you have a long-term Foley catheter, because you don't want to be sitting in an E. coli from the anus that's sitting in the bathtub with you. Oh, so, wow. you know, you want to um, just do the, the shower. And we want to keep the collection bag lower than the bladder. It's two to three liters of fluid daily. Get to the drainage bag before it gets hit um, and all that. So, so the, those interventions in home management are important too. Okay, I know this is quick because we are.